And uh, Joe, what do we got up first? Audit? Audit presentation. So I'm going to let David take over um, and explain why we're here. Yeah, so tonight uh, we have uh, the partner from TKW, our external auditor, Tim, and the manager that was out on the job kind of managing the, the field work, Dan, are going to be presenting the results of the audit, and you, you folks could ask any questions about the audit process or, or anything you would like. But with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tim, the, the partner with TKW. Great. Thanks, David. Hi, everybody. I'm Tim Gillette. I'm, the, uh, I'm a partner with Talbot, Corvola, and Warwick, usually just called TKW, your external auditors. Um, I've been with you at these meetings a number of times before, although usually we're sitting around a big table, which is a little easier than uh, at this point. I can only see like two of you, so uh, Joe and Keith, and that's it. But, um, Anyway, great to be here meeting with you in these strange times we're living through. Um, here to present the annual audit report. It's a little later this year due to the change in personnel that you experienced last fall, or summer, late summer, fall, whatever. Um, and I will, I will go through the audit report pretty quickly as it's based on my experience, that's what people want me to do but I'm always happy to take questions, so I'm open for that. And Dan Miley is here on the, on the call with me as well. He can also answer questions. So first off, the comprehensive annual financial report, big document, uh, there's like 130 pages roughly, and, and only a small portion of it is really the auditors. The rest of it is put together by David and his staff so our, our part starts on what's actually numbered as page one, although the one doesn't show because of the footer on our report. If you're looking at a, at a, and a, a PDF on screen like I am, it's actually page 18 of 129. Uh, so the, the starts off talking a little bit about what we did and what our responsibilities are, what management's responsibilities are, and down at the bottom of that first page is good part, which is our opinion, which is where we say the financial statements uh, present fairly in all material respects the financial position of the city. And it goes on for another page and a half after that, talking about the level of responsibility we take for the various pieces of the CAPR. Uh, the required supplementary information, there are kind of two groups of information that, that we talk about, the management's discussion and analysis and uh, some of the various schedules other than the budgetary comparisons. We don't express an opinion on, although I'll tell you we do read them and look at them pretty good. And then the other part of the required supplementary information, or RSI, uh, we express an in relation to opinion, meaning we think it's fairly stated in relation to the rest of the financial statements. And we talk about the other supplementary information, <clears throat> excuse me, or the OSI, um, and that also we give an in relation to opinion where we say we believe that's fairly stated in relation to the basic financials. We then go on and talk about some other information, the introductory sections, uh, other information and statistical sections that we don't express an opinion on. And finally, we talk about the fact that there is a report required by Oregon minimum audit standards that follows this one's actually at the end of your CAFR. So that's, that's our report. It's followed by management's discussion and analysis. Those of you that have sat through my presentations before know that I always recommend you read that. It's a, it's a good overview. I know you're not all going to read the full 129 pages of this thing, uh, but the MDNA is a good overview, plus it has some comparative financial information in it, which the basic financial statements don't. So it's a, it's a good thing to, to read and look at. The basic financial statements themselves start on page, what is it, uh, numbered page 15, or again, it's uh, 
page 34 if you're looking at a PDF. The good news is there's there's no there's no new accounting pronouncements that cause any great big changes in the way any of this is presented this year, uh, which might be first for a while. There, there was some some new disclosure required by one of the governmental accounting standards board's pronouncements, but it didn't really affect the numbers that much. So most of this should look fairly similar to what you're used to looking at in the past. And I'm not really going to talk about the numbers at all unless some of you have questions. Again, happy to happy to answer questions when we when we get through this. Uh, the basic financials are followed by the notes of the financial statements that give more information, more detail that you need to understand some of the numbers that are in the financials. Um, they go on for a long ways. And again, I'm not going to talk about them unless people have questions. The notes are followed by the required supplementary information, which is then followed by the other supplementary information and so forth. And finally, the statistical information. And then way at the back, the, the last thing that's ours is our report in compliance with uh, Oregon minimum standards. And there are, there's a number of things that are bullet pointed on there that the state asks us to look at. There are eight things for the city that we look at. They're listed out there. I won't read them off for you. There were a couple of items that we uh, had to report compliance failures where the city overextended in a couple of funds uh, more than what had been appropriated, uh, really a nominal amount in the water fund and a, and a small amount in the broadband fund. Other than that, uh, we referred to our report on internal control, and there's actually a separate letter on that where we did have a couple of things to report. And that is really it for the CAFR. Now, if you'll allow me to to move on and talk about the, the other letters that we have. Um, there's actually, there's two letters related to the city in a call. Uh, I will probably call them by what us accountants call them, the SAS 114 letter, which is the, the letter to those charged with governance, which in this case is the audit committee. Uh, there are certain things under professional standards we're required to communicate to you about, and the letter runs through those. We talk again about you know, the respective responsibilities of management and of the auditors. Uh, we talk a little bit about the scope and timing of the, of the audit, we talk about significant accounting principles. Um, well, that's where we mentioned that there was that one new GASB statement that you implemented this year, but it was really just disclosures and didn't change any numbers. Um, we talk about accounting estimates. There are estimates involved in the financial statements. We have a list of a number of them in there that uh, the audit committee may want to kind of keep track on how the city makes those estimates. Uh, we noted a couple of audit adjustments that were made as a result of the audit. Uh, we listed some uncorrected misstatements, which we think, well, management feels are uh, immaterial and not needed to be uh, recorded, and we agree with that. Again, I'm sorry to interrupt for a second. Uh, Joe, again, why are we not getting a copy of this in advance? I yeah, can't I was actually just texting David. They don't see what you're referring to. Oh. And I'm sorry, I was assuming you all had this. But no, I don't have it either. That would have been. Uh, <laughs> so, David, can you please email this to council? I think you went over most yeah, of all in your meetings, but you should have sent it to them so they can see the document. Yeah, I searched I'll for it. I couldn't if, find I'll it. I'll see if I'll be able to, to send it because it, it might be over the, the megabytes because this, this is a large document, but I'll. I'll see if I can send that. Okay. Yeah, sorry about that. That probably uh, changes the, the uh, complexion of what I'm talking to you about a little bit. Uh, the letter goes on 
uh, talks about recently issued accounting standards and things that are going to affect the, the city's statements in future years. Um, GASB just recently came out and announced a project to uh, the final vote hasn't taken yet, but they're talking about delaying implementation of all these new standards because of all of the things everybody's going through with the current pandemic and stuff. That isn't official yet, but it's likely to happen. Uh, one that probably would have the, the biggest effect on most governments would be leases. Uh, and again, like I say, it's, it's probably pushed out for, it would have been in effect in 2021. Now it will be in effect 2022 likely, uh, where you would end up putting, putting any leases you have on the balance sheet similar to a or to a capitalized lease, even if it might be what you would think of as an operating lease in the past. The other letter that we issued is the letter on uh, internal control matters that we wanted to call to your attention. There's kind of three levels of uh, control deficiencies that we talk about. There's, there's the lowest level, which is a control deficiency. Um, the, the next level up is a significant deficiency and the highest level is a material weakness. Material weaknesses are something that uh, conceivably could cause a material misstatement in the financial statements, so that's the most important thing for us to call to your attention. Uh, significant deficiencies are, like I say, a, a level down from that, but they're still important enough we wanted to call them to your attention. We did report a material weakness this year, uh, primarily related to cutoff. We, we ran into, I think, three separate instances where cutoff wasn't quite right. They ended up with making adjustments in the financial statements for that. And the significant deficiency that we noted was some improperly capitalized expenditures in the water fund that should have been expensed. And that's pretty much it, my report on the city. Uh, Dan, is there anything you would like to add? Um, just that, I mean, with the cutoff revenue, that just relates to revenue getting pushed forward or not recorded in the proper period. So most of the revenue that we found um, was, was received by the City, it just wasn't recorded in the right period. Right. right. I say, does anybody have any questions? But without having the documents, it makes it pretty uh, challenging for you to come up with the questions, I suppose. Well, in fairness, yeah, Keith, I can see your lips moving, but I think you're muted or something because I can't hear anything. And I'm sorry for the, the no, late that I just interrupted because you were yeah, talking, ahead. spoke over you. I was wondering if I can be heard. Can I be heard? Yep. Yes. Oh, okay. It's a little, a little quiet on my end, though. But. In, in fairness, David did go over the management letters and with each of us individually, so we just didn't have the full capper, but we did. he did go over the management letters with us. Right. And I'm doing a search. I thought these were sent to you. I'm going through some emails to see when. I searched by yeah, just... There was no audit. Text, audit word sent to. Yeah. And I have the documents here and I have the audit in my, audit, in my office, but that doesn't help the discussion. Sorry about that. No, I'll, I'll take responsibility for that. I, I just emailed out the audit report. Hopefully it comes through as eight megabytes, so it's a pretty large document. It took a took about 30 seconds for it to actually finally send. Okay. Any other comments or questions with what you have, folks? I mean, I think you asked David directly when you met individually your last couple months, but... We still have a police department. <clears throat> um, in short, once folks get their copy and review it on their own, 
Um, if you want to revisit this as a group, please uh, let me know. We can yeah. do that. And Dan and I are always happy to answer questions directly if anyone wants to contact us directly or through David or through Joe. Um, happy to happy to answer those questions in less than a 20 person gathering as well. All right. Awesome. Yeah, I just got your email, David. Thank you. And if there's any questions, you know, like uh, Tim was saying too, I'd be more than happy to sit down with you, with, with any one of you folks and kind of walk through the audit report. And I've made plenty of presentations that Tim is doing right now. So um, I'd be more than happy to sit down with anyone. Great. Thanks, David. Hearing none, we'll... Um, no question, additional questions. We'll uh, move on to our next item. Thank you very much for uh, teams in or wh whatever the phrase, conferencing in and um, giving a review and let you know if we have more questions or uh, if not, we'll be seeing you in a year. Great. Thanks very much. Uh, Dan and I will bow out then now. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Julia, you're on this call, correct? I am. Yeah, Miley. So He's why don't you exiting. introduce our guests? We're going to talk about an update to the Roy Rogers Road widening project, which is a county project, and many of our county folks are on this call. So yes. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm going to just introduce them real quick and then turn it over to them. Um, just as a reminder, I emailed out um, a little update from the county on the appeal status. Um, so um, hopefully um, that answered your questions. If not, we can um, follow up more with you. Um, the, the main purpose of the meeting this evening is for them to talk about the Roy Rogers um, Road portion of the um, improvements and get feedback from council on several elements that they're still working through and then they'll also give you an update on the overall 12 and Sherwood Road project. Um, we have Russ Knoble, Matt Meyer both from the county and then Ben Austin from HHPR that are going to be tag teaming the presentation. Um, I believe Matt is going to be sharing the presentation. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to him and let him um, begin. Julia, this yeah. is uh, Tim. Tim, it, was there, was the presentation emailed out as well? It was not, uh, no, it was, it has not been emailed out. Um, we, we do have it and we will email it out um, if, if necessary, or we can email it out now. Although I guess I can't do that on my surface while I'm also talking to you, but, um, but we can email it. We'll figure out how to get it. If, uh, but I think that he'll be able to share it. We've practiced mm -hmm. that. Um, so he should be able to share the presentation with you guys. That'd be great. Well, if you could at some point email it out, I'd like a copy. Yeah, and that was one of the things I think I meant to do and I didn't. So, um, yes, we'll definitely email it out to you. Um, thanks. Thanks. thanks, Julia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is Russ Knoble. I'll, I'll go ahead and start off. And yeah, Tim, um, definitely Matt's going to be able to. He's, he's much more good or much better at this technology than I am, but he'll be able to display his screen. Um, so hopefully, maybe let's give him just a second to get that up and running. <clears throat> I can see it just fine. <clears throat> okay, so um, I just wanted to kind of start off here real quickly. Just, just, you know, there's three projects in this area. We probably talked to you guys about all three of them. You have the... Um, what I call kind of the 99W crossing there, where we're going from uh, Borchers uh, to Langer, and then <clears throat> the larger project from Langer all the way over to Swallows and Teton Avenue. And then the third project, which is highlighted there in blue, um, is the project we're going to talk about the most tonight, um, is the Roy Rogers Road Borchers to Chicken Creek project. And Matt's going to brief you guys after I'm done on the schedules of all three of those. And so 
<clears throat> basically, I just wanted to start off by, you know, currently you guys all know, you know, Roy Rogers Road in this section is a two-lane road with medians and turn lanes. <clears throat> you got meandering sidewalks and uh, quite a bit of landscaping out there. But all of these amenities are within the public right-of-way. And, and so <clears throat> this project's going to actually change that current look. Um, this project's being designed to stay within the current right-of-way. <clears throat> so what that means is the additional lanes, the multi-use paths, the noise walls, they all have to find room inside the current right-of-way. <clears throat> so with that in mind, you know, the, the, the can Sorry, what was that? Okay, so with that in mind, the public, the county, and the city have had ongoing discussions um, about landscaping, but not only that, but about noise walls and lighting and what that will look like. <clears throat> so we've heard from a few of you already, um, and we've heard those ideas, and, and, and we'll attempt tonight to point out the balance between those ideas and budgetary impact. <clears throat> so hopefully you guys are excited to get to join in the fun. Um, so during our presentation, you're going to see things with costs. Um, keep in mind that the county has about $12.5 million budgeted for this project. And some of the things you're going to see tonight go above and beyond that budget. <clears throat> this doesn't necessarily mean that we have eliminated these items, <clears throat> but the cost is pointed out there just to draw attention to the need for additional funding if the best solution is to proceed with one of those items. So with that, I'm confident the county will see the wisdom of funding it appropriately. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Mayor. Um, so with that being said, I'll, I'll turn it over to Mr. Meyer, and he can start off with the presentation. And I also think we have um, one of our consultants with us, too. Yeah, and this, this is uh, uh, Tim Rosner, just real quick, just to add some color to Keith's comment. Um, I, I think, you know, we understand that there's limitations in the right-of-way and there's budget issues, but we would expect, you know, that kind of leave it looking as best as possible as the way it looks today and not make it a lot worse. So, you know, getting some funding to make sure some of these things happen, happens, I think, is really important. Yeah, and so, so pay attention as we go through this, of course, and, and there'll be some options along the way, and we can discuss those as we go along. All right, thanks for us. So I'm Matt Meyer. I'm, I'm actually managing uh, all three of these projects on Twalton Sherwood Road and Roy Rogers Road from Tualatin um, into Sherwood and through Sherwood. Um, so I just want to kind of step through where we're at and the overall project schedule just to bring everybody up to speed. Matt, you want to blow that up so you're actually seeing the presentation type slide instead of the... Oh, is it is it not showing the the presentation? It's or just showing the um, the. It's not in presentation mode. Yeah, right. going to slideshow mode. So if I didn't put this on my big screen TV in my house, I'd be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'm hitting slideshow mode. Huh. But do it up at the top instead. Maybe that's. Well, let me. Uh, sorry about this. Let me end up. I've got another monitor hooked up, so let me just unhook that. I want everybody to be able to see as big of a big of a yeah. slide as possible. Yeah, definitely. Some of the uh, I'm going to stop sharing and, and and start sharing again. See if it fixes itself. Nope. Matt, use the slideshow tab. There you, there you go. go. Oh, Got it. Uh, brilliant. Okay, so I'm just going to start here. Um, so I, I'm managing the three projects. I'll just walk through the three schedules just real quick to bring everybody up to speed. Um, so this is the 12 Sherwood Road project, the Borchers to Langer Farms Parkway. So we're currently in the final design. We've started the right-of-way acquisition process. So we'll be contacting folks, making offers. Um, upcoming milestones, you know, we're looking at trying to get to 100% design later this summer and bid the project in November and start this uh, late this winter or early next spring. So we're going to see um, see that design in the next 
month. So we've, we've submitted the, uh, the plans to Sherwood throughout the design process. We're, right now we're approaching 95% uh, design, so we'll get those to, um, to the city um, here, and we're, we're, we're trying to get uh, those plans out next month. I, I just want to make sure that you, that you made the changes that we wanted you to make. So this is the this is the Borchers to Langer Farms. Yep. Okay. That, nope, I haven't seen it. If I see it, I don't. It's been done. So. Okay. Are, are there certain things that you want to talk about, or should we maybe follow up to make sure that uh, um, we're on the same page? Street lights, landscaping, intersections. Okay. Yeah. No. I, Ben and I can set up a meeting with, uh, with Sam. Great. Okay. Uh, Sorry, Sam. The second project is 12 Sherwood Road, Langner Farms to Teton. Um, so we're currently in the preliminary design and we're approaching 75% design here next month. We'll be starting the right of way later this summer and bidding the job early next year and construction on that job. It's a, you know, a three mile job. So it's, uh, it's going to be a, a good three, three year construction window to complete that. Job. Yep. And, uh, repeat my last statement on the other project to this project. I just want to make sure we know what we're getting from the changes okay. we requested or incorporated. Okay. Yes, definitely. Um, Roy Rogers Road, this is the project that we're going to be talking about today. Uh, we're in the preliminary design and permitting phases. Um, like Julia mentioned, we've, you know, submitted our land use. That was appealed. Um, we're progressing the design and working towards resolving some of those issues that were brought up at the appeal. The primary issue was the, the public involvement. So we've set up an open house. Uh, but given the current situation, you know, obviously that's a little difficult. So we're trying to work through that. We're trying to do an online open house um, with maybe some virtual options where folks can join us. So um, we're trying to get that out mid-May just to stay on target to continue through the design later this year and bidding the job next uh, spring and starting construction next summer. Hey, Matt, this is Russell Griffin, city councilor. Can I ask a question really fast? Yes, sir. So I noticed on the construction timelines, they all seem to be concurrent. Uh, so at some point during the presentation, if you're going to cover it, can you just help us understand how much of the road's going to be ripped up? You know, what length? Uh, are we doing two lanes? I mean, basically, I have people asking me all the time, what is it going to be like when we're doing this? So if you can add some clarity during the presentation, that would be appreciated. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and that's a great question. And, you know, Russ and I and Ben have worked really hard to try and, you know, obviously come up with a solution that, that keeps people moving on the road. And so the, the design that you'll see, um, you know, in these, in these plans that come to the city, you'll see that we're keeping all of the existing lanes open while we're widening the road. So, you know, we're able to do that by shifting traffic to one side of the road, widening the opposite side, putting asphalt down, shifting traffic to the other side, and then widening uh, the opposite side of the road. And, you know, obviously we know the importance of keeping traffic moving on Tualatin and Sherwood Road, and, you know, it's just not, it's not going to work to eliminate lanes uh, throughout the construction. You know, granted, there will be some, you know, limited days where we may have to flag during the day off peak hours, but in general, the lanes that are out there will remain open for the duration of construction. Hopefully that clarifies. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so now this is this is these next few slides. Well, the rest of the, the, the slideshow is really uh, uh, about the Roy Rogers Road from um, Borchers to Chicken Creek, um, and so really just kind of starting from the beginning to bring everybody up to speed. So this we we looked at several alternatives for a cross section for this section of Roy Rogers Road. Um, it's a tight corridor. Um, you know, obviously it's uh, the gateway to the city and, you know, we're, we went through some alternatives here to try and figure out what the best use of space is. And 
So part of that is you're looking at lane widths, looking at bike facilities, looking at ped facilities, looking at landscape opportunities. And really the best uh, alternative is really this alternative to where we're essentially creating a, uh, a cycle track and, and sidewalk that are adjacent to each other. Um, you can think of it as like almost like a multi-use path. And that's uh, raised up, it's curb tight, and that allows bikes and peds to be off the road, and then we ended up skinning up some of the lanes uh, to fit this alternative within the existing right-of-way. And that's key, because you could see down there towards the bottom where the right-of-way cost, if, if we add a four-foot planter to this, this section, it adds about $2 million just in right-of-way costs. And, and really, all that all we're doing is we're buying property from adjacent property owners to plan a four-foot planter strip. So we really felt like the best solution here was to try and stick within the existing right-of-way, provide the five-lane, you know, capacity that we needed for the road, provide a safe facility for bikes and pets. And so this is the cross-section that the board um, ended up approving, you know, for this project, uh, given the, the, you know, the, the, the situation and environment that we had out there. Oh, oh I have a question. Yeah, where's the vegetation? Well, you know, like You're I said, okay. Coming up, the, the on the budget of that twelve million and change budget, how much of it is coming from uh, the water project? Uh, none of these are costs associated with the water line. This is purely the roadway. So they're paying. They should be paying the county. Oh, you're talking. I'm sorry, I, I misunderstood you. So you're just asking for how much they're contributing towards funding of this project, not how much of yep. that cost. Yep. I'll let, you know, I'll let Russ, if you don't mind, Russ, if you, oh. you want to, you, you were involved with kind of putting together the funding for this project, so I'll let you talk about that. Yeah, Keith, just to, <clears throat> to add there, um, <clears throat> approximately $10.5 million is coming from the Water District to fund this project. <clears throat> it was... Um, it was their desire to try to get this pipe um, outside of yeah. Sherwood before they took over doing their own pipe. So they're bringing approximately ten and a half million dollars to help us build this project. Yeah. Good. And Russ, when you say this project, is it the whole corridor or just this portion? So. So, the, you know, the Willamette Water District, they have a big, long pipe, a billion-and-a-half-dollar project. And so each project they're putting funds into to build their pipe. But what we did early on is we sat down with them, and they said, well, we really want to build. We really want to get our piece of pipe in from uh, Borchers to Chicken Creek. And we want the county to do that as part of a road project. And we said, we don't have the money to do that. But we what we did is we said... We'll take money from all of your projects and take that all as a bundle and put it into this project. So the ten and a half million dollars um, comes from all the projects through this corridor, um, and it's all to to fund this project. Okay. So just make sure is the ten and a half million just for this segment or for the whole um, <clears throat> the whole road all the way out to um, uh, the river there. Yeah, it's it's just for this it's just for this segment from Borchers to Chicken Creek. So so I guess I'm uh, just um, forgive my ignorance here. Was wasn't this project originally a, a project that was identified and funded? No, nope. uh, with, with funds. No, nope. I mean it was on the list, but what was funded um, many years ago. Uh, eight years ago, um, in Mistip was, um, Borchers to 124th, or maybe even, yeah, Borchers to 124th. Yeah, and so the county, were at it. Sorry. Yeah, so the county was able to do more of the project because of the contribution from the water project. Okay, I just tried to understand that math. Okay. Well, it's still not clear, but I'm not going to beat Russ up over it. So the fact is, there's a lot of water money in to help us do more than we would have otherwise. 
Yeah. Okay. Um, so this is the, the typical section, and obviously we're going to talk about some areas where we're going to look at some opportunities to add some landscaping, but this in general where you have a turn lane um, and limited right-of-way space on the outside of the, the, the sidewalk, um, this is kind of what we end up with. And again, this, this is trying to fit a five-lane road in a 90-foot section of right-of-way that's existing and really trying to minimize impact to folks. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Ben Austin. He's going to discuss the uh, landscaping portion of the presentation. Thanks, Matt. So when we start looking at the cross section there and talk, talk about uh, kind of beautification aspects of it, uh, there's areas that we're talking about here tonight. One at the landscaping, which I'm going to talk about now, and then also a discussion about the street lighting types out there and then uh, types of sound walls, just kind of for context to it. So this map shows uh, some of the opportunity areas for landscaping within that typical section. And there's kind of three main areas and we'll run through them via a typical section. But I think what um, we would want to point out from this map is that there's, there's fairly limited areas along the corridor uh, to, to implement landscaping. And so uh, we'll kind of need to work through those. Um, if you want to run to the next slide, Matt. So that, that first area is segments of median. There's three segments along the corridor where we can um, add a median uh, landscape strip into the section. Uh, it would provide both trees and landscaping. Uh, there's also opportunity for landscaping along uh, the sound walls along the corridor. And then uh, there's a couple of areas, particularly along the, the curve, where there's opportunity for landscaping within uh, right of way that's already owned by the county but isn't needed for the typical roadway section. So those are kind of the three main areas. <clears throat> yeah, there you go. Thanks, Matt. The, um, so the, the, the first one, landscaping in the medians. So the, like Russ mentioned at the, the beginning, the cost stuff that we're showing here is kind of a cost differential from that typical section that Matt showed at the beginning. Um, so the upfront cost difference is about $8 a square foot or about $45,000, $50,000 to go add medians uh, in some of the two-way left turn lane. And an ongoing maintenance cost that's similar or lower than uh, the current maintenance cost for landscaping along where Rogers. <laughs> some of the real benefits? It's to similar. It's going to be incredibly cheap by comparison to what we do now. Yeah, uh, yeah I guess. Right just medians to medians, right? Uh, but yeah, there are less medians, so it would be less maintenance, but it'd be correct. Um, some of the, the benefits of having the medians in there are that it breaks up the roadway section, you know, with the landscaping more more so than landscaping on the sides. It confines the traffic a bit, which can help uh, potentially help reduce speeds, and it maintains a similar aesthetic to to what you have today. Uh, some of the downsides of that is that um, there's really only a limited number of locations. Like I said, there's three spots along the corridor where we can get a landscape median there. It has a higher initial construction cost and does require that ongoing maintenance. That's the medians. Uh, there's opportunity for landscaping on the sound wall. So we'll talk a little more about sound walls in a few minutes, but uh, Sound walls are, are um, we're required to look at sound walls for the project and they are justified to construct along the corridor. So there's some opportunity to do landscaping along the sound walls. We have a one and a half to two foot wide landscape uh, strip in front of the sound wall that uh, could provide opportunity for a, a um, climbing vine such as a, a Boston Ivy uh, or some landscaping in front of that. We'll kind of talk about that further if you want to go to the next slide, Matt. So it's important to note we're the home of the refuge. We should be good stewards of the refuge. We should act in a way to support and encourage our community members to act well with how they landscape their homes. And that means no invasive or potentially looking like invasive species should ever be planted by the city or in this case county so 
as I've expressed before, Boston Ivy, English Ivy, any Ivy is a absolute non-starter for me. So I will look forward to the other options. Um, and additionally, six months out of the year, the, there's no foliage. It looks like looks bad. I'll use proper language. Um, and not something personally I want to see. Okay. I've, uh, I'm interested in the other options so that it is green year sure. round or colorful year round. So, uh, and you're correct on all those statements. So the Boston Ivy is the one that typically gets planted on a vertical wall and it's very good at growing in the um, uh, narrow space. It's a, you know, um, a self clinging vine. Uh, but the English, as we know here, is an invasive species. Um, and you're right, Mayor, many people associate all ivy with being an invasive species. But the Boston ivy is not an invasive species. Uh, but it has that advantage of being uh, self-clinging, and it is, as you mentioned, deciduous. So, you, you so know, it does not have fully. I just kill this. Is anyone interested in trying to be uh -huh. anyone interested in supporting the idea of Boston ivy? If we can have a better year-round vegetation planted, I'd like to see what the other options are. So we move on to the next slide. The um, so so the 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 trouble with with the these spaces and how you put uh, landscaping on them is there's not a lot of vines that have that self clinging ability to a wall. So where we where we'd really land would be some sort of um, skinny shrub planted along those edges to, to break up the face, but it wouldn't span the whole height. So how, just how, how tall are the, the uh, proposed sound walls? Uh, they range, predominantly range from eight to 10 feet. It's 10 feet. It depends on the location. So uh, landscaping along the sound wall is uh, about about twenty dollars a foot of additional cost in those areas. It's about a hundred thousand for the projects going the length, and then uh, you know it has a similar but likely less maintenance, like you pointed out, Mayor, than um, than what is out there today. Uh, so you know, but what, so what? Some of the advantages of uh, I guess we can go. Back to that one. Some of the advantages of um, having that landscaping along the wall faces is going to kind of soften those wall faces because uh, there's a we can go back if we need to to the slide of the plan view. But there's there's a fair amount of sound wall, particularly along the north uh, north and northeast side of, of the road. Uh, so it'll soften that face. It can create a unique look for the uh, the corridor and requires a minimal planting it area in order like to hell. get that. First. It looks like hell. It looks like hell. And the proposed budget walls also look like heck. So um, if we have a decent landscaping plan and a decent looking wall, it will be attractive year round. I, I, that raises a question for me. What what does the proposed wall look like? That's, I, I was having a hard time seeing that. Yeah, you'll get to it. Yes, yeah, so those are examples of more of the landscaping on the wall. And we have some slides coming up in a bit here to talk about the look and, and feel of of different types um, as well. But you're right, it is uh, it's a very limited palette of plants that work in that environment, uh, and that is definitely one of the cons of landscaping adjacent to the sound wall. And Dan, can I just, chi can I just chime in real quick and just remind, um, remind the council, because I got a, um, an email from Councillor Griffin earlier today, and I think that there's an expectation that all of these things are kind of like here's what it is, and really the purpose of this is to lay out um, that there's sort of, there's a footprint um, that the county is working within, and there are some options, but nothing, you know, in terms of like how that landscaping occurs within that geographic footprint, that hasn't been determined, and that's really what they're hoping to get input from the council on is those trade-offs of, you know, you know, vines or no vines, um, narrow landscaping, um, maybe more decorative wall or a combination of all of those things. So I just want to make sure that the council kind of realizes where 
This is where we advocate. In the process? This is where we advocate. And when it comes to final landscaping, as I've mentioned before, I'm a big proponent of having a community committee working with the city and county to finalize plants and trees within what's allowed so we have a strong acceptance of the final product by the community. So and I think that we'll talk about that a little bit as we get um, further through the presentation here, but I think that's definitely uh, something that the county is open to. I think this is more about the spaces that are available and discussing some of the limitations so everybody kind of is on the same page and we can uh, start developing a plan moving forward. So the, the, the next uh, kind of area for landscaping is opportunities within the right of way uh, that aren't needed for that typical section. And like I mentioned, that's predominantly uh, along the corner there is, is where Rogers Road heads north. Um, you know, approximate cost about $10 a square foot. We just kind of estimated an area, maybe 150,000 uh, with similar ongoing maintenance. You know, one of the advantages uh, here is that it, we can use some of that underutilized space. We've been talking about how, how tight the corridor is and limited, but this area is a lot less limited with the exception of the stormwater facility that's out there. There's a lot more um, uh, uh, space to do something. Generally, it'd be kind of a lower maintenance cost in there because you're not trying to keep it off the roadway. It has a little more room to grow and breathe. Um, and, uh, and it can kind of visually break up the corridor as kind of an entry as you're making the, the turn there uh, or an exit as you're leaving the city. Um, the, you know, the drawbacks to that are that it is, it's a very limited area along the corridor and it doesn't kind of create a corridor long pattern like you have uh, today. So I you suggested next steps. Or Matt, do you want to cover, talk about this or do you want me to? Yeah, I can, uh, I can talk about this a little bit. Um, Thanks for running through the different areas. Sure. Um, so this is kind of what going down the path that the, the mayor kind of laid out where, you know, we think it's also a great idea to try and, you know, put together a committee and just come up with a plan. You know, we have a footprint, we have available area. So, you know, it's pretty easy for us at this point uh, to almost separate kind of the, the, the two designs, the civil design, roadway design, and then kind of the landscape design. Um, so, you know, we think it'd be a great idea if uh, if we can get some input on, you know, who should be on this committee or focus group, and we kind of run parallel with this focus group uh, with the, the, the rest of the design. Um, and, you know, I think that's a good idea because then we're not, you know, we're not stopping the design, we're continuing the design, continuing our progress to get to bid next year, but also, taking into consideration, you know, the, the needs of the community of what the landscaping needs to look like. So that's kind of what uh, the team was thinking was, let's put together a focus group. We could do, you know, three or four meetings, come up with a plan, and then incorporate those plans into the final uh, project. And off the top of my head, I don't, we don't pick people today, but I would encourage we get maybe somebody from the refuge, somebody from that neighborhood, and then one, two, or three, you know, plant fanatics. Mm -hmm. And I would put my mother in that list because she is one of those, but there's probably lots um, in the community that might be interested in doing that. Mayor, okay. do you think anybody from council should be on that focus group? Well, the focus group will report to council, all right? Oh. So we'll want to so the council will ultimately agree that it's a good idea, the good that the plan they put together is good. But what's the, what's the what do folks think? I'm I'm fine with that. Go ahead, Kim. I don't, I on my microphone. I'm not sure what the problem is, but I definitely think somebody from that neighborhood definitely should be on that. Yep. Yep. I was thinking maybe uh, maybe somebody from both sides of the road or, you know, one of the big landowners over there is St. Paul or, I don't know, someone who has some, you know, some skin in the game. Yep. And, um, you know, I just think, I know, the, <laughs> I know the, I feel like the mayor is holding back and I am the person who emailed uh, Julia and uh, my biggest concern was, 
you know, I know the project has to move forward. I know it's been in the TSP, and because of the water project, it's moving forward. But I feel like I feel like we're scraping all of the, anything that's beautiful out of that corridor, yeah. replacing it with an asphalt wasteland. I mean, I feel like we're trading down to a Kmart parking lot with a few yeah. islands of vegetation. I don't like any of it. So to throw out, well, you can have this little teeny strip and that little teeny strip. Let's get a committee together, and they can pick the plants. I, I don't feel good about this at all, but that's just my opinion. I, this is Tim. I kind of feel the same way, Russell. I, I, and to that end, kind of going back to your first slide where you talked about the three different profiles that you looked at, I just to make sure I understood that, that the only profile that got us that four-foot like planter strip that we talked about was the one requiring um, that we do more acquisition of land. I was curious about alternative one, if you had a view of what that would look like. Yeah, so alternative one is, is uh, and I can't get the pointer to work on this, so I apologize, but basically, do you see where the raised cycle track is? It's right next to the sidewalk. Yep. So alternative one is just putting the bike lane out in the road, just like you would see, any, just like it is now. It's, uh, it's a bike lane next to a travel lane versus a bike lane that's up on a curb. And, and do we have to have a bike lane on both sides? I yeah, know. Yeah, if, yes, typically we would have a bike lane on both sides. Otherwise, you're, you know, you're putting bikes up on the sidewalk then on one side, potentially, or out in the travel lane. And do we have a guaranteed minimum or, um, planter strip between the sidewalk and the retaining walls? You know, is it guaranteed always at least two feet? I mean, in this, in that planter strip areas, you know, six inches it can mean a lot to what you can put in a, you know, a 24 inch span or a 30 inch span. Yeah. You know, I mean, like I said, I'm not, I, I have zero interest in, in any kind of ivy. And if you have a little bit more dirt, you can be a little bit better with plant material. Yeah, I'll let uh, Ben, I'll let you uh, chime in on that. I, I, you know, I think we, we've got anywhere from 18 inches to two feet between the back of the sidewalk and the face of the wall. Correct. With, with the, it a little bit depends on the wall style as well as far as how much space there is um, and what relief it has to it. Uh, the street lights are also located back there as well. Yeah. Oh. So, so not not to throw a, a wrench in this whole thing, but did you did you look at alternatives for like if you go back to an overhead view of the kind of the map that shows the different side streets connecting, like if you looked at uh, Lindley or like if you if you said like at Lindley and said just make those right in right out and just reduce the number of uh, intersections where you where you need that turn lane in the center and create more opportunity for islands with trees and, and such. Because, I, I, you know, basically it would direct traffic, traffic would have to go to a certain exit out of the neighborhood, if, depending on whether they go left or right, but it would create more opportunity. They're going to have to go there anyway because they're not going to be able to get left in or out of there anyway without a signal. <clears throat> and, and this is Russ again with the county. <clears throat> I just add, you know, one of the conversations we had with the neighborhood there was, um, you know, the, the neighborhood closer to Borchers is a little concerned about the neighborhoods closer to Chicken Creek cutting through their neighborhoods. Um, and, and so we did look at this right in, right out on a basis of trying to protect the cemetery and trying to stay out of the cemetery. And you see, we got pretty narrow there in front of the cemetery. Um, so it is it is a trade off. You know, you you do add potentially opportunities for more planting, but you also then get questioned by the neighborhood as to why other people are driving through their neighborhood to get to what they I mean, consider their So they're all they're all public streets, um, and also without without there being a light at Lindley, the people are going to have to go. So lavender anyway, because the traffic is such that you can't do a left in and left out from Lindley very often.
Certainly not a left out. Yeah. Is that, is, is, that, is that a comment based on how traffic is today? Are you saying that it's, it's, it's hard it's to certainly get traffic, out? It, it's certainly traffic today. The one thing that people don't appreciate, and I don't know how much it will impact truly, but having signals, you know, you'll have, you'll have waves of traffic and breaks of between those waves when, when the Borchers light is um, red, but um, certainly people in that, inside that uh, neighborhood, um, we recognize that trying to turn left in, left out um, at Lindley is, is dangerous. So the smart thing to do is go to a signalized light, especially for younger or older drivers. Um, What's not on that map, which I will, can bring up later, but is the importance of a signalized pedestrian crossing at Lindley or somewhere between Lindley and the river mm -hmm. or the creek. So put a little note on that. We can come back to it. So, so just I just want to kind of mention one thing. You know, right now with the three-lane road that's, that's over capacity, the gaps, in order to get out to take a left or are minimal, which is what you guys are explaining. But when you add another lane, you've actually created more gaps. And, you know, we, we, we deal with this, and we've modeled this a lot on, on roads that go from three to five. And, you know, we hear this a lot, that, <clears throat> you, you know, you add another lane, it's going to be hard to get out, but that's, it's actually not the case. It's actually easier to get out because you've created more gaps in traffic. So I, I don't think people at Lindley are going to have a problem taking a left out. Um, um, in all, all due respect, when we, these roads will be built, the roads will get filled, and then we'll have problems. I mean, yes, for the first 18 months, it'll be minimal. Um, then, it, then it will be challenging at best. Um, well, that's just the, the nature of create a, create a faster road, and it, that capacity gets filled up. And I, I would suspect folks on Lindley – there's a lot of folks on Lindley that wouldn't mind if that intersection, at least on the Lindley, just went away because they don't like all the cut-through traffic that's happening there today. But that's just that's a guess. not going to happen. So no. Okay, I think this is more green So in those, so in those planter strips. 18 inches probably ain't going to cut it. We need probably to do what you can to make sure you have at least 24 inches so you can have some real plant material. Otherwise, it's going to be it, it's going to be difficult to maintain, I would guess. Yeah, and I, you know, I think the hard part there is, you know, do we go buy a foot of property across every everyone's backyard to put in another foot of planter strip? Yep, it's trade-offs. So you know that's why you're paid the big bucks. And do we do we have any of that roadway where the sidewalk and the bike path go right up to the the wall, or is there always at least 18 inches to 24 inches all the way down the road? Ben, you want to comment on that? Yeah, yeah there there is always that that width between there. That's so we don't, we don't have sidewalks section. all the way up to the wall. We don't have we don't have that anywhere. At least we've got some distance in the, at the back of the sidewalk. We've got some. Correct. If it went all the way to the wall face, it would be additional width of sidewalk, not part of the the five foot sidewalk that's adjacent to the sidewalk. Yeah. Could you, could you go back to that profile picture again? I apologize. Oh, no problem. Uh, the one with the, the two walls? Yeah, well, what was the, can you show the one with the tree? Okay, so, okay. Yeah, go to the one with the two walls. So, this is probably. You note on that one, though, you got a, you have a, you're putting a six foot walk on one side and a five foot walk on the other. So, again. So, where there isn't a sound wall, there's a six foot white walk and a six foot cycle track. Where there is a sound wall, it narrows up to create that space. And so perfect location where you can have a three-foot 
planter strip on the other side and a five foot walk on the non wall side. I'm just saying. That's just that was where I was going. Or landscaping at the back of the sidewalk. Right. For landscaping between the wall to be be selected let down the presentation and the walkway. So, so if you take a foot off of the cycle inches, track on the right and a foot off of the walkway on the right, you have two feet you can add in between the wall and the sidewalk on the left. Correct. Or you could even separate the cycle track and the sidewalk, which would be cool too. But that reduces the amount of landscaping that's possible. Yeah. So Matt and Russ and I guess um, Ben, is that is that a viable option to like in those situations where you don't have a sound wall or you know where can to shift the the six foot and six foot to five and five and then have more landscaping between the sidewalk and the sound wall? <clears throat> yeah, I, I, you know, I would say clearly it's something we can take a look at and it, and it makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, one, one thing just to keep in mind that, you know, there, there, there's a limited area where we have this type of cross section. So, um, you, you know, we will. Corner. <laughs> well, yes, the entire corner, not the straightaway, not the straightaway. You can have as much landscaping as you want on the corner. Okay, so a uh, dumb question, is the five foot cycle track and five foot uh, walkway, that's a minimum? You can't go to like four and a half feet uh, by yourself another foot? No, I think, you know, typically the six foot walk and six foot cycle track would be minimum. But in this case, because we have to put the sound wall in, we had to reduce that six foot walk and six, six foot cycle track to a a five foot walk and five foot cycle track. So again, it's, you know, these are just, just competing interests, right? We've got bikes and peds who they want a minimum of 12 feet. And that's kind of the direction that we have been given for kind of the minimum section. And obviously where we need to put a sound wall in, we need to, we need to reduce that in order to put the sound wall in, um, which is how we ended up with this <laughs> configuration. Another uh, random question about the, the center strip um, is nine feet. Is that minimum as well? Because it feels to me like I see a lot of center strips that might be more in the six foot range. I, I don't know if that's feasible or not. Just looking for space. Yeah, and I think that's a good comment. You know, the, the problem is, is once we get up to a turn lane, then we need the full width. So even if we reduce that down. A little bit, it, you know. Again, we're just talking about those three areas where we would be able to reduce it and give more width on the outside of the road. Yeah. I think the best opportunity is to cut to, to shave the total width of the the bicycle pedestrian pathway on both sides and give a give a wider. Like I said if you can guarantee 24 to 30 inches. A planter strip that will make a big difference on what we can turn around and plant there to make that wall attractive and not do inappropriate plants that will give people ideas of that something is acceptable in the community even though they don't know what it is that, that, that's a good point and even if, and just to add on to that if you went to the narrower planters in the center and had wider buffers um, between the wall and the sidewalks it just creates some variation as you go down the road, which I think is more attractive than just a set foot and a half or two feet all the way down that section. Oh. Okay. Well, we we can take back the uh, the you know the the comment and discuss internally about trying to reduce that six foot walk and cycle track to get some additional space for planting. Good. So Matt and and I guess all I have a question on on that because I guess I was under the impression that 
changing the geometry would affect the time frame. Um, can you comment on that and kind of how, <clears throat> how we're looking at those things um, affect or doesn't affect um, the, the project timeline? Yes, I mean, obviously any time we're going to make a change to the cross-section, we're just, we're starting over. So if we're going to move the curbs to try and get more space at this point, then, you know, we're at 60% now, so we would put the brakes on 60 and redesign and have to um, go back to 60%. Yep. Hey, if you, if you mess up, you got to fix it. And, and yeah, this is... So. If I can jump in, this is Sean. Um, I'm a city councilor here, Sean Garland. Um, just real brief, I'm, I'm you know, this is the first time I've seen some of these designs as well, and uh, so I am uh, have a lot of the same concerns that the mayor and, and Councilor Rosner have. I lived in Las Vegas for about four years, and I don't want Sherwood to start looking like Las Vegas. Uh, you know, they've got all these sound wall or these sound walls up and down every single residential street. It's it looks terrible, and and this is one of the the jewels of, of our city is that little strip of land coming into the city. So um, I'd like to see some more trees. Okay, absolutely. Sean, you don't want like neon signs all along there. You know, we can talk about neon signs later. It's just uh, you know miles of concrete slab walls and dull gray, uh, tan, light brown tones. I don't want to see that ever again. So. <laughs> All right, so is it okay if we move yep. forward? Um, I'm going to talk about street lights and sound walls just real briefly here and, and just kind of open it up. Well, I, I, think, I, think, I think the way this group seems to work, I think it's better almost to open, open it up for discussion. I just want to get through just a couple of these, and, and then we'll just start uh, going through uh, in your questions or comments. Uh, there's a couple of different types of street lights. The county typically puts a, a cobra head style light in. On arterials, I'm sure you've seen them throughout the county. Um, in this section, you know that would that would mean uh, 180 foot spacing, 35 foot mounting height. The other option would be an uh, ornamental type light, which you see a lot in Sherwood. Um, 100 foot spacing, a little lower mounting height, which uh, again is why you have a, a narrower spacing. Um, but just a couple things to think about, and again, just kind of throwing out these options. Uh, kind of broke this down into ownership energy costs and material costs. Obviously, if it was COBRA, it would be all a, a county cost. And I think, you know, really the Westbrook, there's a couple different options. There's a PGE option um, where PGE owns and maintains the Westbrooks, or, you know, the county and the city can enter into an IGA to talk about how to work out the details on, on, on getting Westbrooks on this project. What, what's there today? Uh, today, I believe there's acorn pipe. And what's the spacing on those? It's probably pretty close to uh, probably closer than what a Westbrook would be. Okay, so so, so how are those being paid for today? Um, you know, I'd have to go back and look and see how those are paid for. I I, I don't know. Because I'm just. The line? I, I'm certainly a fan of an IGA. Um, I'd want to see the numbers to prove why we would want to do PGE, um, but well, uh, I'm, I'm, Westbrook I'm is the only way. I'm, a, I'm all in on Westbrook. But I, I am, too, and the reason I ask about the current arrangement is if, if I'm just throwing out hypotheticals here, but if the, if the county's paying for the current ones, why would that change with the new ones? If we went with the Westbrook, yeah. so we should find out where, how it's being funded today. Oh, so they're probably supplied by the county, installed by the county, and then it's just post. No, I'm talking about the ongoing cost to light them up. That's all. Gotcha. Great. Yeah. Good, good question. Yeah, and I think you know that would definitely be something that we could sort out through an IGA. And you know, I, I apologize, I don't have the details on it. It was just kind of more of a, you know, are we are we think we're heading towards the Westbrook or or a, a Cobra, and from what I'm hearing, it sounds like a Westbrook style, you know, ornamental light is, is the preferred option. Um, and we can, again, we can continue the discussion about the details, but I, I think you have a lot of good points. Any, anyone else on council uh, have a different opinion on that? I prefer the Westbrook. I do too. 
Why is it that the county would pay for the Cobra but not the Westbrook? Yeah, and, and again, those are details that we could work out in the IGA. I think really what it comes down to is, again, what, what is the county paying for now? You know, with the spacing, with uh, ornamental style light, you can see you need about two to every one of these. Uh, and again, I, 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 I'm not here to talk about the, the, the details of the IGA. I'm just, you know, these are some ways to get the Westbrook. So and I don't uh, know what the details of the IGA. Sure. Another design concern on this, and, and um, Julie, and maybe your team can address this too, but with our new small cell design standards and the desire to um, have small cell equipment in uh, contained within the pole, are we are we creating enough space in the right of way for potential small cell poles in there? Uh, I think there's still a lot to be figured out with the small cells, both the Cobra head and the Westbrook styles are envisioned to accommodate that, but remember there's discussion about a wider base, and, and that's one of the kind of the trade-offs with, um, well, I guess with all of them, but if you have the Westbrooks, you're going to have more of them, um, and if they are larger, then they might impact the landscaping as well. I mean, the, and does that make sense? Yeah, that's why I was asking because I remember the wider base issue with small cell deployment. So we want to make sure that works. Within yeah, well, it'll, it helps the argument of why you should have a big space between the sidewalk and the walls as well. Because you could you could potentially have one every five to seven hundred feet down that street. Yep. All right. So Westbrook. I did confirm they are acorns now. Yeah. Well, thanks. But every, just to, I'm not to harp on this. I just want to make sure everyone understood my comment about how how the existing uh, how we pay for those lights today, what the arrangement is with the spacing of the acorns, because that should be the benchmark that we measure any changes in how we pay for it against the new Westbrooks, not not the proposed new. Uh, whatever you call those big, ugly things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the last section here is on sound walls. Um, so we've put together just uh, some ideas on three different options, and obviously if there's other options um, that you folks want to talk about, we can be more than happy to do that as well. So the three are the standard post and panel. Um, there's a decorative post and panel, and then a masonry block wall. Here's a picture of just kind of your uh, standard uh, fluted um, precast panel pilaster sound walls. All in favor of that? <laughs> Keep going, please. Here's a couple pictures of some more decorative post and panel type walls. You know, and I, it, essentially it's the same as the first option. It's just there's form liners and there's different things you can do on the panels to obviously make it a little more decorative. And, you know, roughly going from a standard sound wall to this type is about $5 per square foot. And for the amount of sound, sound walls that we have on the project, it's about two hundred fifty to 300000 um, additional. And obviously, I mean, I think everyone can see the, the pros and cons between, you know, that and that. Um, uh, again, Depending on how it's landscaped, uh, I know we, it doesn't seem like there's a big, uh, um, or there's not, folks aren't in favor of the ivy, so obviously the one on the right maybe doesn't make sense. I, I'm assuming the one on the left, is that kind of like a choose your own design type thing? Yeah, that's just, uh, yeah, just the idea that there's more decorative um, styles out there that you can get creative with either form liners or, in, you know, other, other decorations. I, and, and generally, I really like the look of that. I think it could be kind of a cool, you know, entryway into the city if it's done right. But then I question the value of paying for it if you're just going to plant a bunch of trees in front of it. Yeah, that's a great point. And I think it can be a combination of things, and I think that's the advantage of having that um, – that, uh, focus group or committee to advise on on 
I think not just landscaping, but the aesthetic component of things that, yep. you know, there might be places where you, you may not be able to squeeze the landscaping in ultimately, but that's where you really focus um, some more decorative elements or something. Yeah, that's a great idea. So a combination of standard and decorative depending right. on the landscaping. And having that committee kind of work through what that design element looks like is awesome. I love that idea. Just as long as it's not a picture of anyone, like Keith. <laughs> I really, really applaud that comment. A face of every council member along the, the road. New, except me. <laughs> and, so then, and then here's the masonry block. Yeah, yeah I'm sure um, you all have seen these around uh, various locations. Uh, I think there's a project on um, Farmington and Murray, where they did something similar to the one on the left. And so, you know, really the drawbacks here, and we haven't done a lot of research into this, but uh, there would, this has a continuous footing, which may create more issues, especially with, with landscaping. Now you've got this footing at the face of the wall that you're competing with space for the uh, yeah. planner. Yeah. So clearly, you know, from my, my take, I mean, I was, not overly excited with the the second slide, but if we can see more, and if and if a committee can see more examples of what that potentially can be, um, so that we can preserve planter strip, the two to three feet of planter strip everywhere, preferably three, um, I'll feel a lot better with that option. Hey, Matt, I don't know, did we did we throw in a couple more photos at the end of this type of post and panel? Yeah, here's a couple more examples of kind of a decorative panel. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We got this one. The one on the right's not horrible. Yeah. Yeah. In, in this particular case here, you'd see like you'd have more of a, maybe that's a three foot planter, but a, a two foot type planter with some low bushes. Yeah, so that's, 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 looking, that's looking a whole lot better. Yeah. I mean, well, I think, and I think this is where a committee comes in because the use of color in the cement mix can really make a big difference. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that's all I that's all I had. Um, ben or Russ, do you want to add anything to the the sound wall discussion? No, I just I I, I asked that we added a couple more photos there. That I, I I know there was some concern about a post and panel, but but clearly the post and panel walls have come a long ways, and what you can do with that panel, and and I think that that might help us address the lack of landscaping. I, you know, it, it's just so narrow and tight out there. It's going to be so tough to try to find room to plant trees, to plant large bushes, um, whereas a, a noise wall might give you a, you know, if we can find a good looking one and, and some small shrubbery, maybe that might uh, accommodate every concern out there. If we can get enough planter strip in enough little areas, we can do, you know, stretches of arborvita again, if that's what the committee wants. That's tall, green, 12 months out of the year, and other vertical and ground type stuff. So I don't, I'm not, I'm not going to let you kind of hem and haw and backtrack, Russ. <laughs> 18 inches is just not. I ain't gonna cut it, in my my opinion. We need to be able to make it look as good. I know the county wants to minimize this and that and the other thing, but we can work with a 10-foot concrete slab for bikes and peds on each side. Yeah, and, and it, we really have to keep in mind that we're taking a really beautiful corridor. Um, we're losing something there, so we need to do everything possible uh, from budgetary and from design to make this look as good as possible. So. Yeah. No, I, we hear you definitely. So two other two other things. One uh, one I already brought up, and another that I want to bring up. Um, 
So I'll do the second one first. The, um, currently, what's the county's plan on road speed on Roy Rogers from 99 to the creek? <clears throat> so I'll go. Uh, I'll probably go ahead and, and talk about that. I, you know, I think the current speed out there um, through the city, of course, is 35. So it, it's likely that that continues that way, highly likely. Um, the, the speed changes as you leave town, of course. And so what, what that requires us to do is to do a speed study after the new road is built um, and in place. Um, and we do that speed study, um, and then there's some options of, you know, depending on what that speed study comes back with, there are some options of asking for a lower speed limit. Um, and that, you know, that, that request comes to the county, of course, um, with support of the city. So I can't say it's a slam dunk that that happens, but, but clearly I think the, the county sees some benefit in that and would support that if, if we can get there. Uh, you know, it is truly an ODOT process that does those speed studies, and so that really informs that decision moving forward. So there's a decent chance post-project completion if the council at the time wants to A, ask for the study and press to, like, have speed stay at 35 until the next light, which is Roy Rogers and Shoals, Sherwood, um, we might, if the data supports it, have a favorable um, response from the county? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think there would be a favorable response from the county on that. And, you know, thinking more on that, Keith, I, I guess there's nothing to stop us from doing that now because the, the project we've been talking about is not going to change that stretch from Chicken Creek to that signal. And so you yeah. could, we could move forward with that speed study now. That'd be great. Because those um, things typically take a year or two. Okay. Because from a from a um, big picture standpoint, that corner of Roy Rogers and Shoal Sherwood, that'll be the that's the uh, northern edge of uh, the Sherwood West or the city future growth boundary. So it'd be essentially taking it to the future edge of town. Um, yeah. And so that also be part of the argument. Yep. And then from the neighbors down there, um, if there's if there isn't that acceleration there, then there's a little bit lesser engine revving there. Mm -hmm. there people yeah. just coasting through instead. That would certainly gain some um, fans of, of those folks for that. Um, yeah. Awesome. Another question that I hinted at and we've talked about before, and I'll bring up um, again, um, a signalized um, pedestrian crossing. Yeah, and, and so, you know, I don't know. If, yeah, I don't know our, our time left. Um, this is definitely something we probably want to have further discussion on. Um, what, what I would mention, you know, we, we've heard this concern. Um, we've looked into areas that there could be a possible crossing. Um, the county has some policies, um, you know, they're there to try to address safety. You know, they're a, a marked crossing or enhanced crossing, as you know, sometimes can give a false sense of security. So we want to make sure that, that we're watching out or not putting these in just anywhere that we're putting them in in the right location. Um, a lot of times, you know, where these go in are at high pedestrian demand locations. So there's a high school on one side of the road and a new neighborhood on the other, or, you know, there's a big park or a regional trail. Um, those types of things tend to meet warrants for a enhanced pedestrian crossing. Um, so definitely we want to continue these discussions with you guys and, and talk to you. So what... So what's the process? What's the timeline? Obviously, because we want to be part of the project. Yeah, so the, I, I think the, you know, I think there's still time to have that discussion during this project, um, but it's definitely something we want to start moving forward with rather quickly. So I'll, I'll talk with, the, you know, Joe and Julia after we get done um, or tomorrow, because it sounds like they'll be here late. Um, but uh, 
to chat tomorrow with them and see how we get that process started. And um, I'm actually thinking it might be good. I mean, there's been a lot of good discussion um, this evening, and I think we need to circle back with the county and maybe plan on coming back either the next meeting or the following meeting with kind of, um, you know, a plan of action for this committee and for additional information regarding um, or additional discussion regarding the, the pedestrian um, crossing and just kind of follow up on several of the things that council raised questions about tonight if the county is available and the council is available, um, you know, wanting to have that discussion in about a month or so. That would be great. Would Councilors, be what do you think of the, the importance of a pedestrian crossing there? I think Where do you um, see that at, Steve? Um, the, the, there's really two choices. Um, it's at Lindley. So a, a signalized crosswalk where traffic has to stop. There's, there's a number of them around the county in one design or another. I've got opinions about them, but that's for another <laughs> meeting. Um, and the, the other places, you know, would be um, kind of at the bend where you, you know, you have the future trails um, coming out of um, um, the trail that connects Roy Rogers to Edie. Um, that would be the other potential idea, but I think most, you know, I'll, I'll kind of defer to everyone else on your opinions, but I think those are the two choices, um, but I think we need to have um, uh, have a solution. You know, they're the, we're going to get a lot of, uh, lot of grief if we don't, I think. I think it's important. Yeah, yeah I mean, I think access in and out of those, that those neighborhoods north of Roy Rogers is, is highly limited. Uh, you know, I mean, we can debate how it was originally constructed, I suppose, but that's come and gone. Um, and so anything we can do to provide, especially a pedestrian access, I mean, the, the only one available is at Borchers. It's pretty unrealistic for someone at around the bend area of that development to walk all the way down to Borchers to cross to come all the way back up again to access, you know, either the future trail or whatever other amenities are across the road there. So I, I would agree that something something should be provided. Yeah, and that the closest city park, uh, kind of uh, adding on to what you are saying there, uh, is on the uh, south side of Roy Rogers. So you have that whole neighborhood up there that want to use that park. Yeah, the right. park is the one for me too. That that means if we've got all the other people over on the other side of the street, we got to get them across the street safely. Yes. And crossing three lanes versus five lanes is two different things. And all those all the school age kids, um, grade schoolers, they'll all be you know the, we we want to promote kids walking to school and. Uh, the Ridge schools will be where they're all going to be going. And I know uh, this is Councilor Young. When Mayor Mays and I had sort of a open session with the residents over there in that area, one of their biggest concerns was the safety of their kids crossing the street. So I think it's probably a critical discussion. Yeah. Which also gets back to Keith's earlier point about managing speed as people are coming out of that 55 mile an hour zone into town, safe crosswalks, getting people slowed down, making it safe. And then the the one thing that we don't have a close up on, um, Russ, is the is is each intersection. In a earlier rendition of this corridor, a big you know series of maps you you brought out and put across the table. Um, it had a concept of where bicyclists would be up on the sidewalk and then at intersections they go out into the street and they cross the intersections and they go back up onto the sidewalk. Um, what is the concept today for these intersections for bicycles? And I'll, can we I, that detail? Yeah, I guess I'll maybe turn that to Matt. Uh, he may have that detail already at hand there on the plans, or he might be able to just talk through that real quickly. So the, the current plan is to drop uh, bikes at the intersection 
um, just just for a safety aspect, just because if you don't, then, you know, bikes would tend to um, try and use the ADA ramp, you know, around the curb return, and um, that might not be a, a, a safe way for bikes to cross. Have, have uh, we so our, built that anywhere yet in, in the county? <laughs> The, the city of Hillsboro, they've built, uh, all of South Hillsboro's built that way. I don't know if you guys have been through the, the, the new streets that they've built. No. Uh, um, but that seems to be a, uh, a good way to get bikes out far enough so you have sight distance. So if a car is coming up to the side streets, you know, they're not, they're not going to T-bone a, a bicyclist as they're coming through the intersection. Um, but there's, I mean, there's definitely different ways to look at it. So, you know, if that's something we want to talk about, um, I just didn't know where you settled and I want the council to know what, what it looks like. Cause it's at first, first glance, it's weird. Um, and we've got, we've got bicyclists that we have, we have 10 different standards on how bicyclists should act on our, on our streets. And, and so I can understand their confusion, young or old. Um, we even have a very nice wide bicycle roadway on that the county helped us build on Langer Farmers Parkway that's used half the time by bicyclists. Families, children, 100%. Adults, they stay in the road. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so, and then, then my last thing, and I apologize for dominating the questions um this one last one will shut up if we can arrange to have another get together on the other two segments to see what those are looking like and if the westbrook lights are part of that project and what we did for uh the intersections and the landscaping that would be greatly appreciated sounds good Other comments, questions? Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Russ and company. Thanks, Mayor, Council. Um, thank you. Yep, we know it'll be a good project. We look forward to seeing uh, some changes to make it better. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, follow up also on the pedestrian crossing uh, details. Would yep. be great. So. Definitely. Yeah. Sounds good. Thank you. Thanks, guys. So what's next on our agenda? We're going to talk about the Langer Farms Parkway Roundabout. So um, I have a question, actually, Bob. I don't see the consultants um, from DKS on the line. Is that correct? Uh, Julie, this is Scott Nancer from DKS. I'm here. Oh, you were hiding from me. Okay, never mind. <laughs> Well, then I'm going to turn it over to Bob. You're being entertained by us. <laughs> I'm going to turn it over to Bob, and he will introduce um, Scott, who's already introduced himself. <laughs> oh, there we go. Okay. Um, this study and the presentation that Scott is going to give you is based on a directive we received from City Council to look at the roundabout at Langer Farms Parkway and Century Drive to see if it complied with current design standards and if there were any uh, deficiencies in its um, design or layout or how it operates and if there were what those would be and if we could uh, uh, mitigate those. So. Um, Everybody, I, I assume everybody has seen the actual report. I hope so. Um, and uh, DKS Scott Nancer, who's a principal down at, uh, who's a principal of the of the firm uh, in the Salem um, office, I, I, I expect, um, is going to go through and do the presentation of the PowerPoint uh, presentation, which will pick out the, the highlight data points and summarize the report in a more digestible form. So with that being said, uh, I, I'm not sure if Lacey is available, Scott, but you're on, so I guess okay. you're it. 
So, Bob, I have a quick question. Do you have, um, can I take control of the, so I can pull out my power cord? Do you have that? Uh, you, you should be able to, hang on a second, turn off into the video, show conversations, share. Thank you, Brad, you're okay. to have the ability to do that. So, Scott, you should be able to share if you have the presentation. Okay, can everybody see it right now? Yeah, we just got to work on your internet connection. <laughs> Am I lagging a little bit? It's there we go. Very clear. There we go. Okay, and I'm going to maximize so everybody can see. So is it full screen on everybody's screens? Yep. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you for having me tonight, and I'm uh, excited to, to go through and share our findings uh, with the study we did at Century Drive and Langer Farms Parkway roundabout. Um, the, kind of the summary of my over, or overview of the presentation will be I'm going to talk a little bit about our project background, motivation of the study and the goals, uh, our existing conditions evaluation, um, our design assessment, looking at the existing design, the geometry, the markings, um, signing, the operations, and then our key findings and recommendations from the study. So project background, um, a multi-lane roundabout was, was constructed by the city back in 2011. Um, at the subject intersection, um, there were, the city has received some concerns from the community about the safety performance of the, of the intersection. There's been a lot of crashes at or near the roundabout, and there was a pedestrian crash in October of 2019 um, where we, uh, there was also a concern where some students were hit um, by the motor vehicle. Mayor Mays, are you, is my audio okay? I can I can understand you, but it's it's still still not clear. You sound like a robot, okay. and, and your presentation isn't forwarding. I don't know if that is, is correct that you haven't, or if there's a lag in your sharing. Yeah, I'm, I am forwarding too. So I'm going to take my headset off and try my audio on my computer. So is that better? Yes. Yep. Okay. Move on, come on. Oh, well, maybe not. It's not. <laughs> DKS should have pretty lightning speed internet service and top top shelf we do. We do. <laughs> we recently updated it to, to be as fast as possible. There must be some technical difficulties. Can you maybe try dropping and, and rejoining the meeting? Because this is, is, this is very difficult to listen to. Okay. So I will jump off and jump right back on. Okay. Hold on a second before you do that. Oh, you uh, just did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Brad, you have the presentation. Maybe it would help if you um, if you share it, and then he doesn't have to worry about that. Yeah, and let him say yeah, say some key word when he wants to advance it. Yeah, I, I think he's um, he could try and join the, just the audio portion uh, on his cell phone, and then move it on his computer. Um, that might be better source if he still can't get it to work. Okay. Is, is that any better? Oh, yeah. That's much better. Okay. And let's see. Can you see my presentation? I guess I need to share again. There can, we my, go. can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Everything's Perfect. coming in right, Scott. Okay. Great idea to re restart. So, so this is uh, our existing conditions analysis. We collected some traffic count data and, and also evaluated the existing crashes that occurred in the recent five years of data. We also worked with Sherwood Police um, to collect 2018 and 2019 crash data at the roundabout. And one of the things we found as you look at the traffic volumes is the volumes are actually very low. Um, as we looked at the multi-lane roundabout, um, the current volumes would work very well with a single-lane roundabout. So one of the things, you know, as we looked at this study, is there's pretty pretty low volumes, and I'll get into that in a little bit more detail. But one of the other things to note is there was a real cluster of crashes um, on the northwest corner of the intersection, and one of the things we found related to signing and striping, uh, I think, is leading to some of those additional crashes. So our project approach, we, we conducted our crash analysis. We used the, the last five years of crash data. 
Uh, we looked at the safety priority index system, which evaluates the high crash locations throughout the state. We did some predictive methodology uh, to look at how, how the, this roundabout compares to other similar roundabouts. And our finding with the crash analysis was really this intersection was having fewer crashes than would typically be expected for similar roundabouts. Is my audio still okay? Yep. Sounds great. Okay, perfect. Um, so field observations, we went out um, and, and evaluated this intersection on a typical weekday. Uh, from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m., we evaluated the pedestrians, the bikes, the operations, uh, we looked at all modes of travel. Um, and really the key finding was there's minimal delay for, for traffic. We noticed some driver confusion that I'll talk a little bit about on the westbound approach um, as some of the striping is confusing traffic and the lane alignment through the roundabout. We also observed some limited sight distance and some near misses with some pedestrians to, uh, on the south east, I'm sorry, the southwest corner of the intersection. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. And then we did a full roundabout design assessment. We looked at the geometrics, the center island design, designing and striping, and many of the other geometrics of the roundabout and compared those to typical uh, roundabout design standards. And kind of our key finding for that is that the roundabout generally is designed um, to, to meet current engineering best practices. So as we go through the design assessment, uh, we went through the geometric design and we looked at the inscribed circle um, of the roundabout, the lane widths, the entry lane widths, the curve radii of the, the roundabout, the exit curve radii, both of the entry and exit, um, the pedestrian crossing treatments, and really saw that the, that the current design does meet um, typical standards for the geometrics. If I, um, could, uh, if I could interject one item. Absolutely. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the common... Um, inscribed circle standard for those yes. who don't know the WB50 and a WB67 are uh, semi trucks, correct? Correct. Yes. Yeah. The WB50 is a is a, a truck with a 50 foot, um, a basically truck that, that the that they're towing, and then the WB67 is the long pole trucks. Okay. So for a multi-lane roundabout, those are the types of, of the circle that would be required to, to meet the needs of those trucks. So one of the other community members expressed concerns to the city was about the, in, inter, the, the central island design. And the fact that uh, the vertical and horizontal uh, blocks visibility for the entire roundabout. Um, and, and one of the things that it may be not clear, but really that is one of the design components that is desired in a, in a roundabout design. Not all roundabouts do have that um, obscured visibility, uh, but a roundabout you really want to focus on as you look at this, as the car approaches the roundabout, you want the car to focus on two areas ahead of them, not the whole area. And so you one of the reasons you want to block this visibility is you really want them to focus on the vehicles that are coming around the roundabout as well as, as you're pulling through the roundabout to see the pedestrian and motor vehicles on each of these. Um, so the, the, the current design is consistent with national, gui na national guidance um, for Central Island visibility. So as we looked at the existing striping, one of the concerns we had and we saw a couple of near miss crashes uh, due to this, this lane, this is the east leg westbound approach, and there's a right turn lane and a left through and right. And as you look at the geometrics coming into this intersection, it really drops you into the left turn lane, which should bring you around the roundabout. Um, but since it's a through and right, you are allowed to pull into this through lane to go through or into to go right in this lane. So from this lane, you can really go three different ways in the roundabout, but that was confusing to a lot of drivers. And what we saw is we saw cars that were pulling into the left turn lane and cars in this lane were thinking that they were continuing to the south, but they actually went and went for the through movement there. And so we saw a lot of honking and saw a few concerns. So we think there's some easy striping modifications we can make to clear that up and improve the safety on that approach. 
So as we looked at signing, the yield signing, the regulatory signage at the roundabout, um, key bright signs where we have raised medians approaching the roundabout, uh, all met current standards. Um, on the east leg westbound, the, the approach I just showed was missing a lane use sign to provide advanced notification to drivers as to what the travel lanes are. So that was one line, that was one sign that we noticed was missing um, that doesn't meet the current standards. Uh, pedestrian crossing and accessibility at the roundabout. So as, as we looked at typical best practices for pedestrians, um, the roundabout really is in, in current best practices. There is a new standard uh, that desires that the curb, ADA curb ramps are as wide as the crosswalks. So right now the curb ramps are only about five feet wide, the crosswalks are 10 feet wide. Uh, so the desire would be for those ramps to be widened um, in new designs. But if you went, I went and looked at many of the roundabouts that currently exist in Oregon and, and they are consistent with the, the Sherwood roundabout, especially the design standards that existed at the time that this roundabout was constructed. But okay. everything else? Yes. Yeah, this is Tim Rosner, counselor. Is there, maybe two parts to this, is there any uh, data on the safety of roundabouts versus traditional intersections and more, maybe more specifically when you have a two lane roundabout like this versus a one lane in pedestrian safety? Yes. Yeah, in fact, there's a, a single lane roundabout is significantly safer um, for pedestrians, especially because there's multiple lanes and much longer crossing distances uh, for for the pedestrians on a multi-lane roundabout. So you're you're spot on. Now, a, round, a multi-lane roundabout is still going to have better pedestrian safety than a than a traffic signal, um, especially related to higher speeds except in red light running. So. If you're comparing a, a single lane route about to a double lane roundabout, I say I believe the data is about you're going to have about 50 percent fewer pedestrian crashes on a single lane roundabout. And, and I'm sure you know this, but I think part of my concern, and probably some of the other uh, counselors on the phone here, is with that new entertainment center, Langer's opening up. We have a lot more kids heading from the neighborhoods over to there, so that's part of the concern. Yeah, definitely. We saw a lot of the kids coming um, from that during our field observations. And, and a lot more traffic from out of town. Yep. I think it's safe to say. So as we looked at the, the pedestrian crossing control, you know, all four pedestrian crossings are uncontrolled. Um, there are two rectangular rapid flashing beacons. Uh, what would be pedestrian traffic signals, push button activated. One is down on Langers Parkway adjacent um, to the, the new the, the Langers Parkway development. Um, there's also one to the north. Uh, I can show you. Like, if you can see, man, the the two crossings. There's one right here next to Langer's Entertainment Center, and there's also a rectangular rapid flashing beacon up at the commercial center here. So, based on the existing and future volumes, we we evaluated. Um, there's as you were talking about in your last kind of segment of the work session, um, there are standards and thresholds to meet the, to meet the RFB uh, standard, to meet the requirements both for traffic volumes and the number of pedestrians. And we looked at the pedestrian and traffic volumes on all four approaches, and we don't currently hit the thresholds that would warrant having RFBs at this roundabout. So is that, and just kind of going back to the the high number of kids in the area, is that, are those standards just based on kind of general at the average pedestrian or does that look at the fact that we have a lot of kids using that that aren't necessarily paying attention like an adult would? Yeah, that's a good good point. Um, it is just standard pedestrian uh, numbers of pedestrians. They don't differentiate in those thresholds between um, kind of those vulnerable users. Yeah. 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 So with that in mind, is there anything out there? Because, like, there's studies out there that show that it's really around the eighth or the ninth grade where kids start to become really aware of safety and, and roads and crosswalks. Um, do, do those uh, lighted signals help out with the younger kids, or does it not matter because they're not hitting the button? Yeah, that's a, 
as a father of a senior and a freshman in high school, I totally, uh, totally agree with you. Um, but uh, the well, something to be clear on, it's guidance. It's guidance for when you install those. So if there's engineering judgment for when you feel that those are important and critical to the safety of a roundabout or, or a non-unsignalized intersection, um, judgment can be made to use those. Are we close to the thresholds or significantly below or kind of give us a range, I guess? Yeah, you're, for the, the typical uh, threshold, you're, we're only at about the one third, about 30%, 30, it's about 33% of the threshold to hit the, the warrant. So we're still still quite a ways from from hitting that warrant, and a lot of that has to do with the the low traffic volume. It's not the, it's not the pedestrian volume, but we only have about 400 through vehicles at this location. Most single lane roundabouts have between six to 800 to even as much as a thousand daily or peak hour trips through the intersection, and we're, we're much lower than that at this location. So it's really, like I said, it's a combination of the, the motor vehicle traffic and the pedestrians that the reason we're, we're well below that threshold. So we also conducted operational analysis and the 2000 study that was conducted to justify the multi rain roundabout had some, what I would say, overly conservative growth assumptions for the future 2030 uh, scenario which led to the recommendation for a multi-lane roundabout. And a lot of that came from a land use model that had certain commercial, uh, office, residential land use assumptions in this area. But as we took the existing traffic volumes, this roundabout currently operates at level of service A uh, with minimal delays. And if you think about level of service, level of service is the grades are similar to a, a report card. A is the best, which means you have very, very low delays up to level of service F is when you start having significantly higher delays. And so this intersection is really operating with, with very low delays. And one of, the, one of the problems with roundabouts, when you have a multi-lane roundabout and very little traffic, it ends up, cars end up taking and driving a lot faster through the roundabout. Um, so what we, kind of our finding from the operation analysis, the multi-lane roundabout really isn't needed for current traffic demand. Uh, we even doubled the existing traffic demand and it still works just fine with a single lane roundabout. Now we're going to go through the findings and recommendations. So as we look through the evaluation summary um, of the existing roundabout, our field observation saw that we that it operates well, there's minimal delay, there's some driver confusion with some signing and striping, as well as some site distance limitations that really impact pedestrians crossing at that location. I've got another slide later that we'll talk more about, about some of those site distance limitations. Uh, crash, crash history, we still have a fair amount of crashes, but it's still a little bit less than other typical similar roundabouts. Uh, and a lot of that probably has to do with the, the low volumes at this location. Um, our roadway geometric design, um, most of the roundabout dimensions are in line with best practices, Central Islands, is also in, in line with best practices. There's some minor changes we can make, signing and striping to improve safety. Uh, some of the like, confusing lane assignments that currently exist today. Uh, we have one one ramp uh, width that's less than the crosswalk width. So we're, we're again, that's a newer standard though, and it's probably not. It's a very minor issue when it comes to safety at the roundabout. Um, there are pedestrian crossings or meet best practices. Uh, there's just a lot of, when it comes to operations, there's a lot of excess capacity at this intersection. So some of the short-term solutions that we have considered would be, this would be a, a little cost restriping of the intersection. And if the intent of this would be to uh, restripe the, the minor street approaches uh, and remove one of the lanes and basically make it single lanes for the century drive approaches and just have combined lanes. It's going to improve the things this is going to do. One of the corners that was a problem for the site distance is you have a, a fence right on this corner and for this inside lane that's coming around the corner through the pedestrian, uh, there is limited site distance at, at this crossing. Um, so by moving this, removing this lane and adding, this would just be striping and some channelized devices. Um, it pushes the cars out further and you can see it gives stability of this uh, crosswalk. 
Um, so it's just a real low cost option to improve the safety. And the, the, the rough cost estimate of this would be $45,000 and the timeline for implementation would be approximately three to six months. So is that, was that um, option, compared yes. to that option, uh, staff, what's the, normally we're sweeping and cleaning and other things is whatever obstacles you'd be installing, is that a problem when it comes to trying to keep the other, the unused roadway clean? Free of debris? It'd be, more, it'll be a little bit more work, Mayor. Just crank. <coughs> okay. Yeah, that's, that's uh, a good anything, depending on the devices, you'd have to blow this stuff out into the street to be able to pick it up, depending on what's there besides the striping. If there's no devices, you could actually get the sweeper in there. But with devices, the can candles or whatever you want to call them, the markings, uh, it would create an issue that we'd have to, every time you come once a month, that, that would have to be blown out into the road for us to pick up. Yeah, that's a good point. We, one of the things we could uh, one of the things that could be considered here is actually just using raised pavement markers too, um, which would allow the street sweeper still to, to get over it. It just would, it wouldn't create a, a reinforcement to, to make sure traffic was not driving through that area. And that's what we were trying to achieve with those. Two. So that's a, that's a good point though. Uh, yeah, we have option. So you're not altering uh, traffic coming from the, in this picture, the top, coming down two lanes into the roundabout, that would still happen from the, from the, from the top yes, heading yes. down. No, 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 yes. the top, from the top, move your mouse to the top, yes. there you go. Moving down, it's two lanes into the roundabout. So you'd Correct. stay two lanes entering the roundabout? Yes, Mayor Mays, it would be still two travel lanes, both northbound and southbound through the roundabout, and just a single lane east-west. So that was the, the short-term option. And then we had a longer term, which would actually be a physical of, of moving the curbs and just redesigning this intersection of you know, the single lane roundabout. That would also lead to changes in the water, water treatment system. Um, this would be a much higher cost um, option. It would be approximately 250,000 to 400,000 to modify the signal to, I'm sorry, modify the roundabout to a single lane from the existing multi-lane. Um, as, as we talked about earlier, this single lane would provide much shorter crossing distances for pedestrians and would also reduce the travel speeds through the roundabout as well. And the timeline would be significantly longer, It'd take probably a year to two years um, to imp to design and implement the changes. Is there not an option to just do the restriping with maybe the other stuff you mentioned to make it one one lane all the way around, but not a full reconstruction? Just kind of option A, but but one lane all the way. Yeah. So what you're saying is just to also remove one of the travel lanes north south through the, through the roundabout. That, yeah, that's what I'm asking about. Yeah, so basically apply the same treatment on all four. Yes, that would be that would also be an option that could be considered. And this was the the long term solution. Uh, as we the the side distance, um, there was limited side distance at a couple of crosswalks. Um, we observed some some conflicts. Um, there's a residential fit fence and some vegetation. In fact, the first day we did our field work, uh, the vegetation clearly blocked one of the pedestrian crosswalks for northbound traffic through the roundabout. The next day we went out, the city crews were out there and cleaned it all up and the visibility was much better. Um, so there's just some elevation changes as you're entering and, go and traversing through the roundabout you know, block site, site distance. So our solution was that uh, some right of way should be required should be acquired on the southwest corner to push back the existing fence line and the vegetation either be trimmed or removed to improve the site distance now we'll improve the driver visibility 
Now, if you, as we talk a little bit later, if you do the striping modifications that we're discussing, that also accomplishes it, which would keep you from having to acquire the right of way from the adjacent property owner. Um, this is, these are the areas in this slide. Uh, this is the fence that comes to the corner that blocks visibility uh, to this pedestrian crossing. And this raised lot and the shrubs block the pedestrian crossing at this location. Does that, uh, Julia, does that fence meet our fence code standards? Uh, I'd have to look. Um, it may not, but I'm not, I'd, ha I'd have to look more closely at it. Okay. It is a backyard fence, which is allowed to be at the lot line, but it may be past the lot line, maybe. Yeah. It comes, as you can kind of see, it comes right to the edge of the edge of the sidewalk on the corner. But as I mentioned, for now, with with the current lane, if you were to basically remove that lane and just have the inside lane, the visibility is much better to that pedestrian crossing. Oh. The other finding with the inappropriate lane assignments for that westbound approach, uh, the left through right lane um, just really creates some confusion. Um, and just some minor striping modifications and signing modifications would fix that issue. Uh, it would cost about three to $5,000 if you did that alone. Joe, I have a paintbrush. Um, I can go, I can do that cheaper for you. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah, part of that is also the removal of the striping, grinding it off. Can you do that, Tim? Sure. Okay. If you have a blowtorch, you can just melt the thermal plastic right off. There you go. <laughs> Don't give them ideas. <laughs> that, that sounds like a lot more fun. Yeah. So what we were proposing here is instead of having the left, through right, and right lane, is just to change this to a left-only lane and a through right, so your left turn aligns perfectly with the existing left turn, and then the through right has the option to go to go right or through, and the lane alignment matches up. I know this is gonna sound silly, but I always find when they actually have a left turn entering a roundabout, I think it causes confusion with drivers who think they can actually turn left in the first <laughs> intersection. I don't know what the yeah. data shows, but it, it always looks wonky to me, and I've seen people be confused by it. Okay. Yeah. Yes, the traffic has to be different. My 15-year-old uh, daughter, who I'm teaching how to drive, was definitely confused by this intersection. I bet. I bet multi-lane roundabouts are, are challenging for for drivers that aren't used to to traversing the, the roundabout. That is one thing about the left turn. That, are the left turn arrows the roundabouts uh, actually usually have a circle, and they actually show kind of the elongated. Yeah, left turn going around it, and that would be, uh, that's what we would be proposing. Okay, good. I have seen the actual left turn lanes and it, it, the arrows that like look like the one on your map, and it, it makes no sense because you, it never in a roundabout are you making a left turn at all. So I, it's highly confusing in my opinion. Okay. Yeah, well, so we definitely use that. Technically, you're turning left the entire time around the roundabout, but. <clears throat> yeah, I can see. Fair I mean, point. I can see. Fair point. Yeah. <laughs> Really splitting hairs there. <laughs> <laughs> no. All right, so um, on this westbound east leg approach, it we're missing the lane you sign. You can actually see where it used to exist. I don't know whether it got knocked over at some point, um, but we need to get that. Uh, once we make the change, uh, get that information out there to drivers as well to, to clarify uh, the lane alignment. Uh, very low cost, $500 at max to install that sign. But if we did the other option where we actually removed one of those lanes, then the signage would be different. Correct, yes, exactly. Yeah, you would want to, because you that sign is giving the lane use sign telling them what, what lanes are what. If you just have one approach line use, you wouldn't even install, install lane use lane use sign because there's only one lane for them to use. But yeah, that was a good point. Um, one other finding, um, we were at, we went out and, and observed this intersection at night, um, and it has some old high-pressure sodium bulbs, very orange light, the visibility uh, is not great. Um, we looked, I think I've got a, a picture here of the existing lights at the intersection, uh, but we recommended just modifying each of those luminaires at the intersection to be new LED lights um, that provide a little bit lighter, wider light and per, uh, will provide 
provide the city with better visibility um, at night, especially with, uh, we did see a lot, we actually saw more pedestrians and students walking at night um, from the Langers Entertainment Center than, than we did during the day. So during the winter time, especially because, you know, it gets dark at 4.30, they're going over there after school, so. Right. So our recommendation summary, um, we've kind of split it into three packages. Our first package is the, the reconfiguration, the single lane on the eastbound and westbound, um, which would improve the sight distance, um, would improve, it would improve the lighting, uh, as well as the sight distance and um, westbound uh, approach, the issues we're having on the westbound approach, and would basically make the eastbound and westbound uh, a single lane roundabout and the northbound southbound would continue. Um, option B is the permanent single lane reconfiguration. Um, the overall cost would be significantly higher, about 283 to 435,000 for combining um, the single lane with the other lighting um, improvements. Um, and then the multi, a no change would be leave the multi-lane, um, make the, the site distance improvements, uh, and uh, the westbound signing approach. I, I'm sorry, I, I package A um, is, is basically just the restriping, and, and option C is no change. You're just doing the, the side distance improvements um, and then the westbound signing and striping approach and the lighting. But as you can see, the, the restriping here ends up being almost a similar cost to that no change option. So those prices are very options. So we just felt like our recommendation was the kind of the best bang for the buck would be package A, um, which makes those makes all those changes, um, so makes those short-term striping changes. Yeah. What would be the additional cost to go to option A.2, I think, as Councillor Scott talked about, to yeah. right for just one lane all the way around? Yeah, I would I would say that would add about twenty to twenty-five thousand. I I did the cost estimating for the single lane and. Um, that signing and striping, it would probably add about 20,000 20, additional, 20 to 25,000 would be my estimate for that. Hey, so, Joe, um, being around. appreciate the presentation and the study. Um, Joe, from a staff's perspective, I mean, uh, uh, Julia, Craig, Chief, uh, Bob, what, uh, what's, what's your staff's recommendation? What's the right solution? If, if I might um, interject on one item here, uh, the single lane roundabout also um, with the restriping only um, is predicated on the current traffic loading not being sufficient to really stress the roundabout um, operation. If we stay with that and do uh, the restriping, it still leaves that dual lane roundabout option available in decades out yeah. when the traffic loading would be much higher and it would warrant opening it back up to a two lane roundabout with yep. some with some corrections that need to be made. I think option B takes away the ability to to actually expand the system. You're gonna you're gonna take the system that's expanded, reduce it, and then have to expand it again twenty years out. I don't think option B is a good one. Option B is a non starter for me. It, no no way. Right. So Hey this um, is uh this is Sean Garland. I just have a, a simple question. I'm racking my brain. Is this the only two lane uh roundabout that we have in town? Are all the rest of them one lane? Yep. 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 Okay. Yeah that well I the high, yeah, the high school will be constructing a two-lane, or yeah, not the high school, but the county will be constructing a two-lane. Yeah. But yeah, but isn't the two-lane at the high school going to be more of a typical two-lane all the way around versus kind of this hybrid two-lane, one-lane that this one is? No, it has it has a uh, it has a dual lane roundabout all the way around for the northbound, southbound would be two lanes. The Kruger uh, entry is a single lane and the um, future Cedarbrook Way is a single lane. So similar type of configuration. Okay. But I think the uh, difference is, is that you have the traffic warrants. And so, I mean, I, I don't think the confusion 
from what I understand in reading the study, I don't know that the confusion is necessarily going to be the same no. level because we don't have the traffic volumes that warrant no. that. We won't. So I think package A is probably the only option I would consider at this time. Um, the hybrid that Doug suggested we could look at. Um, but going into it, I hadn't thought of that at all going into this, and I was going to recommend option A or package A. So my, my only question on the hybrid then, if it will make it safer and we're not losing future ability to take advantage of the double lane 20 years from now, why wouldn't we do that? But that I don't know the answer to that question, so if you take a look at it, it'd be great. Yeah. We hadn't looked at that, Councillor Rosner, so... and. Another 20,000 it's worth looking at, um, but B and C to me just didn't make sense for a variety of reasons. Great. Completely agree. Yeah. So just, just to, we did evaluate um, that hybrid A if we, if we made it just a single lane, um, we made a single lane northbound, southbound, and from a volume standpoint, it's going to work fine for at least five to ten years. Um, but if, if you, you could also implement option package A, see how it works, see how you feel, and, and there would be nothing that would preclude you from in the future also going back and, and changing the north-south to a single lane if you're not pleased with how it's operating. Well, the other, the other aspect I'm thinking about, too, is, you know, public reaction, right? Whatever we do, we want them to see it and go, yes, that's an improvement, right? Yeah. So if, if option hybrid A kind of really reinforces that, I, I don't know what the answer is, but, you know, we also want to think about it from a public perception point of view. I also think um, if we change it and then change it again, it's going to just offer more confusion. So we need to come up with a plan, but the plan is going to be for a long term. The plan, so the plan. If it's the hybrid option A, then, then that, that would be good. Okay. So, hey, Mayor, Mayor, this is staff to consider yeah, how long do we anticipate option A will last or hi or hybrid option A will last? And then, yeah, I'm going to defer to staff on which of, the, which of those makes most sense. Yep. Uh, just one, one, one last comment. And it's basically just to make sure that I'm getting the, the proper feedback is that everybody is basically comfortable that the roundabout design did meet standards back then and currently, you know, for design standards that we weren't, we didn't do something drastically wrong with this thing in how we initially set it up and what we did other than overbuild it. Um, but that it is still meeting safety design parameters for the configuration, generally speaking. Are you, are you asking for our judgment on the current? I'm just, I, what, I, what I'm trying to get is a, a, a basic head nod that, yes, we're going to do some stuff, but we're going to make it better, but it still meets safety design parameters so, Bob, I, I think that the, the study is demonstrating that. I don't think the council needs to head no, on. Correct. I, I, think, I, mean, I think that's what the study, unless they were totally challenging the validity of the study, then I think the fact yeah. that they're not, you know, I think they're accepting that the study is a valid study. That's all. I just wanted to make sure that everybody was on board with that. Well, no, in this, in this in no way are we, or at least I'm not, in any way saying this is an indictment or how we did it for the current engineering standards. I think Scott brought up a point when we were talking about the safety of, for pedestrians and traffic circles, they're guidelines. You know, we have, we have different circumstances here. We have an entertainment center with a lot of kids going back and forth. So we're, we're being, some might say overly cautious, but you know, why not? Why not make this as safe as possible for our kids? It's not going to impede traffic. Yep. On that note, I wouldn't mind getting a cost estimate on, you know, putting 
signals on those pedestrian crossings, at, at least the two that cross Langer Farms, maybe not the ones that cross Century, or, but. Yeah, we can certainly get some more, some more information to you. I think what we're hearing, though, is that you, you don't disagree that a full scale or for full sale, you know, redo of the um, the roundabout is necessary. That there's some uh, potentially relatively minor tweaks to make it safer, um, and we can continue to to refine that and talk with you guys about what those specific tweaks are going to be and how much they're going to cost, and frankly, how they're going to be funded. Um, so we can continue um, having conversations with council. Yes. Yeah. All right, I think we're done with yep. this one. Awesome. Right, Thanks, BJ. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, guys. That was a good presentation. And Scott, if you can stop sharing your presentation, I, don't, I, don't, I think you have yes, to. Yes, I will. Yeah, I'm not sure, Brad, if that needs to happen. There we go. <laughs> you got it? Yep, thank you. Great. Good Thank job. What is, what's next on our list of topics? Well, next we have the very uncomplicated and uninvolved urban renewal um, discussion. <laughs> um, so, and Elaine is just on it. She's already shared her screen. I'm going to uh, briefly introduce Elaine Howard and uh, Nick, and I don't know how to pronounce your name, Popinick? Popinick? That's correct. Popinick. Which one? <laughs> Pop Popanuk. Popanuk. Um, they um, are um, with Elaine Howard Consulting and Tiberius Solutions, and they're working with us on the urban renewal feasibility study areas that we spoke with you about a few months ago now. Um, and they're going to kind of talk to you briefly about urban renewal and then focus in on the three study areas that we are planning on working on, but we really, before they dive in too deeply, we want to make sure that um, you guys are all on board with the specific areas that they're studying because it's much more complicated um, to revise it after they've started doing the work. So um, with that, oh, and then also um, just a reminder, Bruce Coleman is um, here and will chime in or add as appropriate. Um, so I'll just go ahead and turn it over to, I think, Elaine, you're starting the discussion. Correct. So everybody can see my screen? Mm -hmm. Okay, I just want to confirm we have a little over an hour. I know we got started late and I don't know your appetite for time frame. Does that still work or not? Any objection? Hearing none. We're okay. Good. I didn't give people a chance to unmute. Let <laughs> 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 me move on. <laughs> That's right. a good strategy. So we'd like to start with a roadmap just to let you know what we're going through as we do the presentation. So I will be uh, giving information about tax increment finance. We call it a 101, and then I'll go into a little more detail that we call a 201. Nick will give some examples of other communities, and then we'll dive into your own feasibility study and talk about the potential boundary areas. Um, since we're a little late, I'm going to go through my part pretty quickly. If someone wants to jump in and stop me at any point, um, feel free. I do, ha I do pause at the end of my part, so if you have overall how does tax increment finance questions work, we can take those at the end also, at, at the end of my presentation. So the first question in many community, it, communities is why use TIF? TIF stands for Tax Increment Financing. And communities, you have your own urban renewal area, also now called a TIF area. And generally communities decide to use those areas because it provides them funds to implement existing city plans. It provides dollars to pay for infrastructure, to service housing or industry or commercial centers. Um, it is a mechanism for stimulating economic growth and creating jobs. Urban renewal also often, I'm sorry, provides a funding source to bridge the gap in making projects 
um, financially feasible that may not otherwise be financially feasible. Tax increment financing is looked on as an economic development tool. It's unique in that it actually is a plan that gets written, but it also comes with a financing tool. It is used to address lighting conditions in uh, communities, and it functions on the increases in property tax revenues in urban renewal areas. It is used all over Oregon, um, and we don't have the map on the next slide. I think we took that out to make this go a little more quickly. Um, this talks about urban renewal financing and just how it works. So our all of us who own property in Oregon pay our property taxes and that property tax revenue goes to regular taxing jurisdictions. That property tax revenue increases for really two reasons. It increases because of 3% appreciation um, of existing property values, assessed values, and it increases because of substantial improvements or new construction, new development. As that property tax revenue increases, if you have an urban renewal area, the property taxes off of the value of the area at the time it's established keep going to all the regular taxing jurisdictions. But if you have a new urban renewal area, the property taxes off of the increased value within that urban renewal area go to the urban renewal agency to do projects, programs, and pay for administration of that area. Urban renewal areas have to be conditioned on finding blight. That's a prerequisite of the statute. Um, it is generally defined as underdevelopment or under underutilization of property, poor conditions of buildings, or inadequacy of infrastructure, including streets and utilities. Blight is established in an ordinance adopting an urban renewal plan. An urban renewal area functions uh, on an income source, which is the yearly property tax collections based on the assessed value growth within the boundary. It has expenses, it has this budget, a budget is adopted by the agency every year. Those expenses pay for the projects, programs, and administration. And it has a spending limit, which is called maximum indebtedness. Maximum indebtedness is the controlling feature of urban renewal areas, and it is established when an urban renewal plan is adopted. Duration is not a controlling feature of an urban renewal area, by statute, but some localities decide that duration may also be a component or controlling feature of urban renewal. By statute, maximum indebtedness is the only one that has to be established by the city. This just shows the same concept we talked about in graph form because some people relate to this a little better. It shows that on the gray on the bottom, when an urban renewal area is established, the assessor establishes what's called a frozen base of assessed value of that urban renewal area. All of the taxing districts continue getting their property tax revenues off of that frozen base. The blue increment is the increase in assessed value over time in the urban renewal area. And the property taxes off of that increment go to the urban renewal agency. Sometimes those projects get completed before the bonds are paid off and that's what that bar at the far right end of this graph shows. Um, and then it also shows that when an urban renewal area expires, there is increased property tax revenue for all of the different taxing jurisdictions to help them provide their essential services. So urban renewal division of taxes does not increase property taxes or property tax rates. It is a division of taxes based on taxes people already pay. If you have a renewal in the community, as you do in Sherwood, every property tax owner on their um, bill, property tax bill, sees urban renewal as a line item on that property tax bill. That line item is there whether or not they're within the urban renewal area. This is because 
of a complicated system of how the assessor has to collect that division of taxes. Um, and we, we aren't gonna go through that whole system tonight, but suffice it to understand that the assessor does a calculation of the amount of growth within the urban renewal area and the taxes to be raised off of that growth. And then the assessor distributes that amount of money that needs to go to the urban renewal agency, let's say it's a million dollars, distributes that citywide to all of the different property tax bills and it is collected through that division of taxes. And again, that doesn't mean that those property taxes increase, it just means a portion of the property taxes that uh, those owners pay goes to the urban renewal area instead of going to the different taxing districts. This is a, a little bit more complicated part that just shows uh, a bit about how the assessor goes through that calculation. So this looks at a potential property in Sherwood that is $100,000 value. We use that so that you can easily multiply that by increments for a higher value. The tax rate um, in Sherwood for the permanent rate taxes is 12.5558. So on a $100,000 value property, that property tax owner pays $1,255.58 in property taxes. This shows um, what happens the next year with the 3% increase on the assessed value of this property. So those property taxes go up by 3%. Up, and then next. There we go, there we go. Um, and this shows that that increase is actually $37.67. So if this property went into the urban renewal area um, at the value of $100,000 when the assessor establishes the frozen base, the other taxing districts will continue receiving property taxes off of the taxes within that second column that shows the 2020 year. The assessor would take this $37.67 from this property and uh, accumulate that with all of the values of all of the other properties within the urban renewal area to figure out how much amount, the, the amount of dollars that the urban renewal agency will get through urban renewal off of this property. You can see on the last two columns that whether or not the city would have a renewal. The property taxpayer pays the exact same amount of property taxes. It's just that it is apportioned differently depending on whether you have an urban renewal area or not. There's sometimes a question to me from city councilors of why can't we just establish an area and use our own city tax rate and say that the increased value from that area would go to projects and you could hypothetically do that. The problem with that is the city of Sherwood tax rate is 26% of the total tax rate for your city. So by using an urban renewal area, you're gaining an additional 74% of the 100% pie of taxes to be able to use for project programs and administration in the area. So that explains why urban renewal is such a powerful tool for you is you're able to leverage your own city tax rate with the other tax rates to have additional funding to spend within an urban renewal area. Hey, Elaine, this is uh, Tim Rosner. Could you go back to that slide real quick? Yes. And, and this is just for the benefit of council. So the 38% of that is for the Sherwood schools, but keep in mind that all of that money collected goes to the state and then is redistributed back to all the schools across the state based on their formulas. So a reduction in their uh, revenue on a go forward basis because of that tip doesn't necessarily, it impacts all schools across the entire state evenly, not just the Sherwood schools. That's correct and that's a really good point and I, um, I hit that in a couple of slides also. So I'll reiterate. I'm sorry about that, I just wanna make sure. That's no problem because 
especially in Sherwood, I know in, in all communities in Oregon, they value your schools. In Sherwood, I know you especially have very strong schools, so it's a really important point. So the impacts to the taxing districts are what funds urban renewal. Urban renewal does not provide new money. It diverts property taxes that would otherwise go to taxing districts, including the city of Sherwood. They continue receiving taxes on the frozen base, but temporarily or for the full time frame of the urban renewal area, they forego taxes on any growth in the area. There is the concept of urban renewal that that growth may not have occurred, but for the ability of urban renewal to do projects that will facilitate that growth happening. So the next two slides talk about the schools issue because it is so important for other than the local schools and the education service district, the impact is directly on the regular taxing jurisdictions as you can see by this graphic. This is what the state school fund funding formula looks like. We, we have a number of slides that get us to this, but in looking at our time frame tonight, we decided just to show you this, which shows how complicated the school funding formula is. The bottom line is schools are funded on a per pupil basis through the state school fund. Urban renewal does not directly impact the amount of money that goes to schools. If you have urban renewal in your community, it does not renew, reduce the amount of that per pupil funding formula. That formula is established by the legislature. They fill that state school fund with a variety of sources. About 30, when we did this graphic, it's a couple years old. At that time, the state um, property taxes were about 31% of the state school fund with the general fund, which is mostly income tax revenues, about 63% lottery funds and other federal sources. So urban renewal anywhere in the state has an impact on the state school fund. Um, the state school fund is backfilled by the legislature to be able to meet the per pupil funding ratios that they establish statewide. So there aren't any new taxes to the property taxpayer due to urban renewal. Schools are indirectly impacted by urban renewal. There will be a line item on the urban renewal on the tax bill that says urban renewal. And any new urban renewals do not impact bonds or local option levies. And that's really important, especially I believe the Sherwood School District um, does use bonds. So you can be com comfortable knowing if you do a ur new urban renewal area, it will not impact any of the bonds issued by um, either the city or the school district. There are state limitations on urban renewal for a city under the population of 50,000. You may have up to 25% of your assessed value and 25% of your acreage in urban renewal. An existing plan may not be increased in size by more than 20% of the original plan acreage. And the maximum indebtedness may not be increased by more than 20% of the original maximum indebtedness as indexed by inflation, unless you get concurrence of other taxing jurisdictions. A plans adopted in a very specific way, identified by statute. It has to have public, improve, public involvement. It has to be reviewed by the agency, a presentation to the county, reviewed by the Planning Commission for conformance to your comprehensive plan and have a City Council hearing with a vote on a non-emergency ordinance um, and notice to all citizens. And you also have to do a consult and confer 45-day time period with all of your taxing jurisdictions. So I went through that really quickly just so that it would give us enough time to talk about your own area, but we'll pause here and see if there are any questions about the basics about how urban renewal works? So, Councilor Rosner, uh, Mayor May stepped out. Do you want to facilitate this while he's gone? Uh, sure. Are there are there any uh, ca uh, questions from Council on this section of the presentation? A lot of us have, since we have an urban renewal district, a lot of us are familiar with it, but it's good review. Hey, Nick, Nick jumps in here. 
All right. Thanks, Elaine. So Elaine covered uh, urban renewal in general. Uh, next, we're going to do a brief presentation on some specific examples of how urban renewal has been used that might be informative uh, for what Sherwood is thinking about in terms of how it could use the tool going forward. And then we'll uh, jump into the specifics of this project. Um, so the next slide shows a map of all the urban renewal areas in the state of Oregon. This map is uh, fairly recent. Elaine uh, maintains this and updates it periodically. Uh, what it does show is that there are a lot of urban renewal areas uh, in dozens of communities all across the state, uh, particularly in the greater Portland metropolitan area. Uh, Elaine and I have been involved with uh, maybe close to 70 of these urban renewal areas so far. Um, so there are a lot of examples that we could choose from. For tonight's meeting, we're highlighting three. Um, the first is uh, the Coffee Creek Urban Renewal Area in the city of Wilsonville. Wilsonville has three traditional urban renewal areas and several site-specific TIF zones. Uh, we're going to talk about both of those. This Coffee Creek Urban Renewal Area is their most recent one. This was a mostly vacant, unincorporated um, uh, industrial area. Everything not shaded in blue was unincorporated at the time that they formed the urban renewal area. Uh, huge amounts of development potential here, but also huge amounts of infrastructure that needed to be funded, uh, and that was always preventing the private sector from developing this area on its own. A key part of the strategy for urban renewal in this area was to include some adjacent developed property along with all of the vacant land. So um, you can see on the map there's a road called Commerce Circle. The properties on that street were already developed. They had a, a decent amount of assessed value, and every year they were going to see a small amount of incremental growth through appreciation. The city strategically included those properties, knowing that they weren't going to redevelop anytime soon, but that that little bit of appreciation could help uh, jumpstart the urban renewal area. And so that's always something to keep in mind when you're looking at new urban renewal areas and you're looking at blighted properties that really need some sort of public intervention in order for them to get going. You can wind up with a chicken and an egg scenario or a catch-22 where you need the development in order to pay for infrastructure, but you need the infrastructure or any development will take place. So this is one strategy that the city of Wilsonville used, including a, a targeted amount of already developed property in order to jumpstart the amount of assessed value in that urban renewal area. Uh, and the next slide on this just shows the list of projects here. A, a couple of things actually that are um, instructive from the list of projects. The first is that uh, in, in this particular urban renewal area, you'll notice that all of these are really solid infrastructure investments. They are clearly pipes and pavement. Um, these are the types of infrastructure investments that tend to get overlapping taxing districts, the ones that are going to have to be foregoing their tax revenue for a number of years. These are the types of projects that they can often uh, get on board with because they can see that this is true infrastructure making a real investment in the area that should pay dividends in terms of increased development potential. Another thing to point out with these project costs uh, is that they are shown in both uh, current 2016 dollars when this urban renewal area was adopted, but also in nominal or year of expenditure dollars. So the city made sure to estimate uh, how much inflation would be taking place between when the plan was adopted and when these projects might actually get carried out. Uh, it's important so that you don't wind up uh, having a budget shortfall down the road for not adequately dealing with inflation. One other thing to point out with these projects is that the amount of tax increment revenue that was forecast to be generated in this area 64.9 million was less than the total project cost. And the city looked at that and they did not want to uh, extend the life of this urban renewal area any further than they were planning on. I think it was 25 or 30 years that they set this up for, I think 30. Um, and so the city went forward and said, we know that we're not going to be able to pay for 100% of all of these projects with urban renewal, but we will find other sources, SDC revenue, or other grants or other funds, developers, or private sources to help pay and fill that gap. Um, and so that's just something to think about as you move forward. You will likely have a long list of desired projects for any urban renewal area. 
and you'll look at the financial capacity, and those two things might not add up. And so part of that conversation is determining which priorities or which projects are a high enough priority to stay on the list and is the city going to be able to find any other funding sources uh, to chip in and fill the gap? So the next uh, project we wanted to talk about was also from Wilsonville, and this is their concept of TIF zones. So these are site-specific urban renewal areas. They are only one tax lot, and rather than pooling the growth and assessed value from multiple properties to build infrastructure improvement, this instead is used as a tax rebate program, an economic development tool. And so developers who would meet these qualifying thresholds uh, could receive uh, the city's approval for this program, and then through urban renewal, their taxes would be collected, but then rebated back to them in, in future years. The threshold that the city chose was tied to the state enterprise zone program, so 25 million of new investment 75 jobs at 125 percent of the median county wage um, ultimately the city chose only a handful of specific sites and those specific sites with those strict criteria did not wind up having any match uh, in the roughly eight years that this program was in place so the city just recently let the existing tiff zone program expire and we're working with them to develop a retooled version of the program that uh, adds a little bit more flexibility on the number of jobs and, and amount of investment and includes some tiers of uh, in investment thresholds. So it's not an all or nothing, but uh, smaller developers could still qualify for a lower tier of benefits. Uh, and the city's pretty excited about the retooled version going forward, looking at you know the economic conditions uh, around the world today uh, and having a local tool that can be used as an economic development incentive uh, where the city is in complete control over setting what those thresholds for investment are. The third example that uh, I'm sharing tonight is the Port Westward Urban Renewal Area. This is in Columbia County, Oregon, right up on the Columbia River north of Klatskanai. Um, this area is similar to Coffee Creek in that it's a large industrial rural area, undeveloped, um, that had lots of infrastructure needs. Uh, what I wanted to highlight about this on the next slide is the difference between the initial plans and what actually happened down the road. So this urban renewal area was established in 2001, so we're almost 20 years into it right now. This slide shows the list of projects that they were planning on that, that, that were originally included in their plan and then how much they actually spent on those projects. Um, we can see that there were a couple of projects, in particular this water system project and uh, rail infrastructure that wound up costing significantly more than they were budgeted. Um, but then they had some road improvements that came in under budget. And then there were a host of other projects that ultimately uh, were not funded, um, primarily because the private sector wound up delivering those on their own. Uh, and I just wanted to highlight this because uh, if the city decides to move forward with an urban renewal plan, you will do everything you can to set this plan up to be reasonable, financially realistic, and something that reflects the priorities of the community today. But these plans do take uh, two or three decades to be fully implemented, and things will change over that time. And so whatever is in the plan today, something else down the road will be ultimately implemented um, as priorities shift over time. Uh, and the next slide reinforces this. This shows that originally in the plan, uh, they were assuming that they would have to cover most of these project costs uh, with tax increment finance revenue. They ultimately were able to get a lot larger contributions from private sources, and then the tariffs are collections uh, from uh, user fees from the rail infrastructure that they built. So uh, when you are looking at sort of large-scale, more industrial construction, those types of uh, private source uh, funding is a lot more realistic. When you're looking at more of a commercial downtown or residential areas, um, you know, those types of funding are less likely to be available, and you will be looking more at the tax increment thing. Um, so that was all of the examples. Uh, we're about to walk through these elements of the feasibility study that we'll be conducting for the city of Sherwood, but I guess I'd pause just now to see if there were questions on those examples from other communities. All right, 
sounds like we can move on. So for the city of Sherwood, we are conducting a feasibility study. It's important to note that we are not uh, under contract to create and adopt an urban renewal plan. Uh, so Elaine showed earlier that if the city decides to move forward with a plan, there is a very large process that would happen from that point forward. Uh, that includes public outreach, that includes planning commission, city council, uh, going to the county. So there would be lots of due process moving forward. Right now, this feasibility study is largely a technical exercise, and the uh, public meetings are going to be these work sessions with city council. So this is the first of what we have planned three conversations where we'll be talking through the technical financial details with you. And what we really are focusing on at this point are spatial considerations. What are the appropriate boundaries we should be looking at? And then the financial feasibility. So with those boundaries, what are the projects the city would like to fund and how much revenue might be generated from them? And do those seem like a good match? Is it something worth exploring further? Uh, the overall project schedule in this already has shifted a little bit. You'll see that that first city council date was listed as April 7th. It is actually today, April 21st. Uh, but overall, we're looking at roughly a three-month process from this meeting until the project is completed. After today's meeting, once we have the city council input uh, on the boundaries we'll be evaluating, we'll then dig into the real meat of the financial analysis. We would plan to come back about a month from now and share our preliminary results with you, discuss those implications, and then we'd go back, make some final changes to the analysis, summarize it all in our final memo or report, and then uh, bring that back for a final conversation this summer. So that's the planned schedule here. Uh, with that, we're going to turn it over to this conversation of the actual boundaries that we are proposing to look at. And this is really where we want your input tonight to make sure that the boundaries we are evaluating uh, are the ones that make the most sense to you today. Uh, we will quickly uh, show some metrics for the existing urban renewal area. So your existing area is around 615 acres. That's almost 20% of the entire city. That's worth noting because, as Elaine said earlier, urban renewal areas uh, in the aggregate are limited to no more than 25% of the city's acreage. That means there's not a whole lot of additional capacity right now to create new urban renewal areas. That's something that will need to be addressed through this process, and there are a few strategies to address it. Uh, one is waiting to establish a new urban renewal area until the existing one is closed down and expires. Uh, another would be to move forward with a smaller urban renewal area that's more targeted in its scope. And the third approach would be to remove some acreage from the existing urban renewal area. Almost half of the acreage uh, in the existing URA is either exempt property or right-of-way. And that land is not generating any of the tax revenue that is being used in the urban renewal area. Additionally, I understand that the city has been under levying its revenue, so it has more capacity than it actually needs for its debt service obligations. So all of that suggests that it's feasible to remove some property from that existing urban renewal area. Um, with that, we'll look at the three urban renewal areas that staff have recommended that we study in this evaluation. And I'm actually going to turn it back over uh, to Bruce and Julia to walk you through why these boundaries were selected and what are some of the key questions and uh, areas where we're looking for input from council. And I'll start, and then Bruce can uh, tag team. So this is um, primarily focused around the Tonkin employment area, but based on conversations with Nick and Elaine, um, we realized pretty quickly that they're, by including more area, again, if it works out from a, um, the percentage standpoint, if we include more area, um, we can um, begin to, to leverage that um, increment sooner. Um, and then if you recall, there's the project on Sipol, um, I think the Sipol Industrial Project that's currently under construction. So that hasn't hit the tax rolls yet, but um, if we formed this um, within the next year or so, um, would sort of automatically be a pretty significant increment that could help fund some infrastructure in the Tonkin employment area. Um, and we also identified the possibility, and, and this is shown on the map of the um, the existing, uh, it's shown on one now, but the um, 
the tannery site, there's some developed property, so that could um, help the, the increment. There's also some vacant property that could redevelop, and then there's also the tannery site that we've been talking about that we could potentially um, use um, TIF funds to do some cleanup and or improvements on that site. Um, and then there's also a few other properties um, that are identified as two and three that are um, vacant properties that could potentially redevelop. And so we just wanted to point that out as possibly, um, you know, if we included those properties um, and they developed, then we'd be getting that increment. Um, so on from the, the, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Bruce. So on the far west side in number one, there's about a six acre site that there was a Southern California developer looking at. Uh, they decided not to proceed fairly recently with that, but there'll be another developer at some point, and this could be an opportunity to, catch, to capture some of that tax increment. Number two is about a two acre site. It's a small site, but it is an undeveloped site that's certainly being looked at and it's being marketed. The number three is about 3.55 acres, and as soon as the, um, the Galbraith sewer goes in, um, we're going to be working very closely with the, uh, the listing broker on that to market that to um, end user businesses and developers. So that's another opportunity for some tax increment to be generated over time. So we want to get thoughts from the, what we initially asked um, Nick and Elaine to, to look at is the area that's outlined in the black. If we included uh, the, the tannery site, that would require us to remove those from the existing URA. So we definitely want to have that conversation um, with council, but we want to get feedback from council on whether or not we've included too much potentially for studying or left something on the table. We Again, we didn't initially propose um, area two or three. So this is, this is Keith. So in this area, the biggest driver need we've identified is um, the road to be named later from Oregon uh, to 124th uh, to help with that project. Um, but clearly um, an option is to help with um, potentially a, the future public works site um, and or work on Oregon um, Street um, along that between the roundabout and uh, um, Old Town. What other type projects are on a wish list, dream list in this area that could make sense, Julia, Joe, Bruce, Council? So there's, there's a lot in the Tonkin employment area and supportive of, of the Tonkin employment area. So obviously there is the east-west collector, um, but there's also, you know, water, sewer, storm, um, and there's the improvements at the Tonkin, Oregon um, intersection, um, as well as along Oregon Street as well. And then there's also the possibility, we haven't really started discussing this much at all, but there's the possibility of um, using URA funds to provide incentives um, for development to come in that aren't just infrastructure based. If, if we're talking wish lists, I mean, we talked about the uh, moving the public works building, but I believe on part of that property, we've also talked about creating parking and uh, mm -hmm. an observation area for the wetlands over there. Yes. So other, other thoughts in a, in a dream scope perspective? I mean, because that for me kind of drives um, the size and shape of this thing for me. Mm -hmm. And I guess the, the, the reminder of the, um, if we just focus on only the Tonkin employment area, then we're not necessarily getting the advantage of those already developed or soon to be developing properties to help. I understand. Start. Yeah, okay. It, no, okay. I probably, unfortunately, know. Yeah, I, I know a lot about urban analytics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
And maybe I can add the reason the time frame, I think you probably already know this, the reason the time frame is as important is we obviously have a very active application from Trammell Crow right now. And uh, then in addition, we have due diligence going on with regard to the 38-acre site on Oregon Street by a major developer now. Um, so we're trying to see opportunities to capture that increment to reinvest in the area. And maybe the, the, the comment, which I thought was interesting, because uh, I didn't, I've, I've learned something new already. Um, I'm sure I'll learn more that we can reduce the acreage of our existing urban renewal district. Uh, there's a process to do that, um, so that in the event council was supportive of continuing to study this area of whatever size, and if we implemented an urban renewal district here of whatever size. If we need, if a future council determined that it was larger than warranted, it could be reduced potentially. Yeah, and, and Nick, can you um, chime in? My, my recollection is that you guys were sort of recommending that it's easier to study more and take it out than to study less and put it in later, which is another reason why um, it, it, it might be bigger than we ultimately decide to do based on the existing URA and that kind of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, this, this conversation tonight is not going to be the one where we establish the final urban renewal area boundary and, uh, you know, there's no take backs. So the city has got to live with it forever. Um, yep. This, this is just the initial evaluation and we like to draw our, our pen a little wider in the initial evaluation. You know, if that comes back and it shows that this thing is going to generate uh, tens of millions of dollars overnight, then the city can say, well, let's scale that back. That's, uh, that's far more than we need to. But um, often that's not the case. Often it still shows that there is a shortfall in the area and it's going to take a long time to fund these projects. And so um, it's best to just draw a wider boundary to begin with, and we can always pare it down as we go along. And this is Elaine, just just for the understanding of the acreage issue. Um, even if we were able to reduce the existing area, taking out all of the tax exempt properties and most of the right of way, we still could not do this full area and stay within your 25% requirement. So we can look at this area and, and analyze it, but if you decided then that you wanted to proceed with an urban renewal plan, I, and, and as part of our recommendations in the feasibility study, we'll address that issue and make recommendations about what kind of area you could actually adopt in, in an urban renewal plan. But this is too large uh, as it sits. Yeah, 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 I agree. Other thoughts or questions? So um, I guess are, are we? Are, I guess we're moving on to boundary two. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll go back. I'm sorry. No, I, are we needing um, to get council um, virtual head nods on the boundary to study, or is them not chiming in saying do something less or more sufficient? Well. If you do you Sorry. want us to chime in now or wait till we see all of them or? Yeah, let's wait till we see all of them. That's, that's a good suggestion. Okay. And, and Julia, just to clarify, we're talking about doing the study in all three areas. We're just talking about what the boundaries should be. For those areas, are we going to? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so the study will inc basically include the three areas and then we'll be coming back to you guys with the information about those three areas and then making decisions on cutting back or changing or, or discussing the timing of things and then whether or not we move forward on on one or all. Um, so there'll be a lot more discussions. So the proposed boundary two, I'll, I'll start by acknowledging um, perhaps the elephant um, on the screen, which is that the YMCA property is not included. Um, what we had, the reason for that is that we thought that the line could essentially, um, you know, go right along the YMCA property to include the right of way and a potential pedestrian bridge, but not um, burden the 
the acreage and the the value because it's essentially not um, not taxable. Not taxable. Um, so that's the rationale, but we can certainly discuss that if there are projects yeah. on the YMCA property to include. Go ahead. Target. What well, was that? This is Keith. I thought that's smart. Don't include the Y property. Okay. Um, the other properties are all um, pretty much vacant or, or redevelopable to a large extent um, and you know, kind of part of what we would be getting an um, assessment or uh, increment on, except for the um, the Woodhaven Crossing um, development that is being circled with the arrow. Um, and the thought of including that, I mean, it's, it, it sounds like it could be controversial because that's, you know, a lot of residential properties, but um, the thought of including that is that we would immediately have the opportunity to get that 3% increment um, a year and we wouldn't you know so it would be something that we would know that we would get and not have to wait um for development to occur um nick elaine or bruce do you want to add anything to that no i think our oh sorry no bruce you go ahead first i think the the intent was to try to include as much of the area that has real development potential but there's not a lot of existing development in that area to really help with that with that three percent so that's the reason for at least suggesting at this stage that we include that that residential area yeah and, and to piggyback on that my understanding is that the uh, sort of pedestrian bridge overcrossing here is a, a high priority project that folks would like to see delivered sooner rather than later Urban renewal traditionally takes a long time to generate uh, hefty amounts of dollars. And so anything you can do to help jumpstart it in the early years uh, will be very effective at trying to accommodate a multi-million dollar project on a short time frame. Any questions or comments about the boundary? At this on point. the western the western side of the landing near the school high school site, we would just make sure that the right of way for the roundabout um, is included um, near the high school. Right? Well, maybe you're, that's what that shows. I guess. But um, yeah, maybe that's something that we can highlight more a little bit more. Um, Nick, with your GIS folks, making sure that we're including the entire right-of-way and including where the the pedestrian bridge may land so we're not missing something. Yeah, and um, fortunately, those kinds of small map details uh, where we're talking about non-taxable right-of-way and especially if the, mm -hmm. the property that abuts the right-of-way is tax-exempt school district land or tax-exempt YMCA land, the, those specific boundary uh, changes won't affect any of the financial analysis that we're running so we can we can go forward with our technical analysis and sharpen our pencils on the boundary uh later on all right so with that in mind too i mean um just speaking of the ymca property if we were and i'm just keeping all options on the table here but if we use the area to fund an expansion of the recreation facility it would have to be within the boundary as well correct yeah, correct. And uh, Elaine, I think this might be a decent time uh, if you want to talk about the recent changes to Oregon uh, urban renewal law dealing with public facilities. Yes. So last uh, summer in the legislature, there was a bill passed, House Bill 2174, that changed urban renewal and specifically addressed some of the concerns of the impacted taxing districts. One of their biggest concerns was the use of urban renewal funding on public buildings. And the new legislation requires that any money spent on a public building and a recreation facility is defined in this statutory change as a public building, would have to be approved by three of the four taxing districts who levy the permanent rate taxes Three of the four largest, biggest tax rate of the taxing districts that levy permanent rate taxes. So 
Um, in, in your area, that's going to be the city, the county, the school district, and what did we say the other one was? Net Corner District. TVFNR. Yeah. Okay. Um, I have to tell you, TVFNR is pretty yeah. friendly. Um, they're very supportive of infrastructure. I'll, I'll put it positively. They're mm -hmm. very supportive of infrastructure. They are not supportive of using money on public buildings. But if we got the school and the county along with us, that would meet the requirement. It, uh, it would meet the requirement. You would still have, I would predict, TVFNR oppose that project in your plan throughout formation. So you could still do it but they, they would verbally oppose it. Sure. Yeah. Sure, okay. So, so for study the first point is a good one for a study standpoint. It's, it's not gonna matter um, for the financial uh, boundary study, um, but before you formed a district, you'd have to, the city have to make a decision to include that piece of property um, or not, um, right? That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you're right. We can go ahead with the feasibility study and not um, not worry about that because it doesn't provide any any taxes at this point. So remind me though, in the feasibility study, are you in the first part? Are you guys um, looking at the potential? project costs? Yes, I think uh, we would love for the city to be able to provide the, you know, the list of projects that are desired in each of these areas. And so if a rec center expansion is on that list and if it has a $10 million price tag or something, and if this whole urban renewal area shows that it's only going to generate $10 million over the first 20 years, um, then that would obviously be something that would affect the decision on whether or not you would want to include the rec center, the YMCA site, uh, you know, even for even entertain that discussion going forward. So we we can uh, we'll run the financials and then um, it's really up to the city to provide the project costs and the project list, and we can surely uh, compare those and show how big of a gap we're looking at. Okay. So so is it in the interest of casting a wide net that can always be pared down is the the current residential areas that you have down here near the YMCA um, enough should we be adding some of that on the north side as well in terms of the analysis like the Cedar Brook or is that Cedar Creek or Cedar Creek view apartments in that whole area up there but by the traffic oh circle? that's yeah so what he's referring to um, Nick and Elaine is the area Essentially north of Handley on the north side of 99, where, yeah, right there, yeah. and, and even to the, um, to the, yeah, there. The multifamily unit. Yeah. Maybe even on the south side where you have similar type, uh, south side of 99. Yep, that, that area. Just if you're doing the analysis, we can always pair it back. It might be worth considering looking at those two. I, I as a, from a technical perspective, I think that makes a lot of sense. I. Urban renewal areas tend to be slow getting out of the gate, and I understand this, but, and, and pedestrian bridges tend to be expensive. And uh, trying to do a pedestrian bridge early on with urban renewal, let alone other projects down the road in this urban renewal area, I think you'll be hard-pressed uh, to fund it with a limited frozen base. And so anything that we can do that logically makes sense, the properties are tied closely to the area, they'll benefit from the types of improvements we're doing here, um, and it sounds like that's true here, then it makes sense to include them in the feasibility study stage. Yeah, and the only other property I would consider is just north of the uh, cul-de-sac on Pinehurst there, because there is a active, uh, uh, isn't there a, a On plant? the south side of 99, um, the, uh, no, uh, further to your left, further. Right there, there there, right above, above that, that cul-de-sac. Yeah, right. right there. Yeah, because that's, that's that's a planned uh, medium density uh, subdivision, right? Uh, y y yes, um, it is. Um, I, I I think we didn't propose including it because it it was 
going to be single family residential. Um, sorry, I've got a child knocking on my door. Just a second. Um, still in my meeting. <laughs> no. <laughs> um. <laughs> Uh, Come on, ice cream is the right time right now. No, she's asking if I if she can let her cat in here. <laughs> like no. Um, so sorry. Um, All right. So, uh, so yeah, I, I guess I would defer to others on whether or not that makes sense to include. Yeah, I mean, it will certainly will provide some value, but it's probably not. It's going to be residential, you know development about, you know, like single family residential type, I mean, small lots, but it's not the same level of multifamily. They just stuck out, so I thought I'd mention it. I, from, a ta from a tax gain perspective, it'd probably be from dirt to 15 or 20 homes be a bigger increment um, than... Right, than 3%? Yep. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's exactly right. I think that's a strong argument for including it. Uh, again, we can always take things out, but it, it's much harder if we get to the end of our study and then somebody asks, well, what, if someone asks us three, three months from now, what would happen if we included it? Mm -hmm. We don't have an answer for you, but if you ask us what would happen if we took it out, that's much easier to tell you. So, yeah. perfect. Great, Great. thanks. Okay. Study area three. Um, so this was primarily we were focusing on um, the the areas on the uh, northwest side of 99, the Anderson property, Vandersan and Steinborn property that we got the TGM quick response grant to look at and, and wanted to kind of see whether or not doing an urban renewal area there um, could provide some um, infrastructure support to open that up and again in the, in the conversations with Nick and Elaine we realized that that area alone was probably way too small um, to to make anything um, happen and so we proposed to include some additional properties um, except there most of them are already in the existing URA and so that would have to come out um, and then also a lot of that is um, PGE owned land and, and going to be um, limited anyways. Um, Which so, is my agenda before. Right, right. Um, so, Brad, or Brad, I just saw your name, Brad. Um, <laughs> Bruce, Nick, or Elaine, do you have anything else to add on that? No, just the idea is that that's the northern gateway and there is potential for new development to occur in that area. Um, and and uh, therefore there could be there could be increment coming from it that could over time help fund the some of the infrastructure, but it is it is the challenging in that yeah. regard. And I and I will point out that um, this area, um, ha, you know, the the property owner, especially Mr. Anderson, um, is very interested in something happening there. He's probably um, either he's watching this evening on YouTube or somebody. Um, representing him is or both um, so just want to make you know acknowledge that that there is a lot of interest um, in in this area especially um, you know from the property owners um, being considered as an urban renewal area so one of the primary again goals or potential goals of a area here would be to extend Langer Farms Parkway across 99 and down some in some means down behind the kind of the concrete block strip mall thing um, to, uh, to the sort of parallelogram property. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, but most of the most of the green on the uh, right side of 99 uh, is owned by PGE. Yep, correct. So you don't include that. Could could we also like turn this into an East Coast, you know, congressional map and like create a little corridor all the way down 99? 
99 to join those two areas into one URA? Yeah, absolutely you could. Um, they can be studied separately for their own independent financial projections. And then we can always say, well, what if you join them together with a cherry stem? You know, the numbers would be the same. We just add them up together. There are pros and cons of that approach. Uh, the pro is that you're liable to be able to do any big project sooner um, because you, you've got more growth happening at the, at the early front end. Um, the con is that it can be difficult uh, when you're managing these things going forward to strike the right balance of, well, how much of the money are you investing down here versus up here? And why do I have to wait so long for my projects when those other folks got theirs funded earlier? Um, so there, there are pros and cons when you're, when you're looking at those options, uh, but it's definitely something on the table. Right. And I, and I just remember too, we can have multiple URAs too. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, the, other, uh, the other thing, this is Elaine, that you could think about here is one of those single property URAs too, if, um, if you were trying to encourage development to occur here um, and you, by acreage, weren't able to put the whole thing in a URA, um, this might be a spot where if, if you needed to do something, you could do a single property URA um, that ends up giving property tax rebates once property taxes are paid. Yeah, I think the challenge with that is the uniqueness of the situation here and what it needs requires it to cross multiple properties. The, the infrastructure is across. I got gotcha. you. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, I I support studying it, you know, and see what see what you learn. It's a yeah. It's a. Mm. Elaine, I stepped away from earlier uh, for a little bit. Um, so I have a, there's a question I don't know the answer to, shocker, um, not the, when there's multiple funds uh, paying for a project, um, let's say uh, yeah, we want to build, build a bridge um, and the district isn't, doesn't have very much tax increment financing ability on day one when you want to build it, uh, but you've got another bucket of cash from whatever, from wherever to go towards it. Do you have the ability to build the project, have it um, and seed it with other monies, and then once the tax increment financing um, can pay for the rest, then have it have the district retire the loan and convert it into an urban renewal loan or? Yes. So with some caveats, yeah. we, we looked at this in another urban renewal area recently that was just being formed and received a legal opinion that if the infrastructure was already put in before you formed the urban renewal area, you could not pay it back. Mm -hmm. But if you had established the urban renewal area and then made maybe an interagency loan or something like that that obligated the urban renewal area to pay back once it had the increment, that you could do that kind of an arrangement. So maybe it's a city general fund or maybe it's a state infrastructure fund money or some other source. Um, that, yes, you can then obligate the urban renewal area to pay back once increment is available. And pay back all of it? Doesn't or... have to pay back all of it. It could pay back a portion. Interesting. That's yeah, it's, it's music in my ears. And yeah. It's uh, actually one of the most powerful tools that you can have for an early urban renewal area is having some other public bucket of funds that are willing to front load the costs and that are willing to be patient in their repayment. So um, a lot of these urban renewal areas, you know, we're going to look on paper and say, even with just 3% growth, there will be money here in the near future, and we'll be able to start using that to pay back the debt.
but you couldn't walk into a bank uh, and say, hey, could I get a $5 million loan for an urban renewal area that's never collected a dime in its life? Um, so if you're trying to finance projects entirely with the urban renewal area standing on its own two feet, it can take a long time to get real financial capacity. If you've got the state or the city or the school district or somebody else that can fund a project up front and you come to terms on an agreement, whatever interest rate, whatever amortization period uh, folks can agree on, then that works wonderfully for urban renewal areas. Our, the success of our existing one happened in no small part because um, the theater, Target, and Home Depot all hadn't gone on the, the rolls yet. Uh, they were all under construction. Um, and we for, it was formed um, before the, the full value hit the, hit the tax rolls. And that really helped jumpstart it. But anyway, so that's a great that's great news from a leveraging standpoint. If council so chooses, thank you. Yeah, so this slide is just showing uh, all of those areas on the map together. Uh, the the yellow tan color is the existing. The green areas are the proposed new parcels, and then the pink are the overlap where we be would need to remove property from one in order to put it into the other. So just to put everything in context on the map here. And then this, uh, again, is the numbers side of that, of that last map. And so it shows the total amount of assessed value here. Uh, there's, this is fairly common because urban renewal areas tend to be blighted uh, vacant properties that we're considering. Um, even if you were looking at putting all of these together, you'd still be beneath the statutory limit on assessed value. But on acreage, it's another story. So if you were to try and pursue all of these, uh, you'd be using up 41% of the city's acreage, um, well above the limit. So um, as we've talked about at various points tonight, we will certainly be exploring through this feasibility study what are some strategic approaches that you could use to accomplish urban renewal uh, while staying within these limits. And, and again, the limit was 25%? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. I think that is the end of our official presentation there. So uh, any so, additional questions or discussion from the city council? It, it might be great to go back to the um, the slide with the that one, so just so that we can discuss if there's any more um, discussion on the boundaries or you know, obviously questions are, are open as well. I definitely got on the, um, the boundary two, um, we'll have them revise the, the area to include um, those residential areas that we discussed. Um, but are there any other thoughts on changing boundaries for any of the other study areas? The, you know, and we, I probably missed it too, um, we will be closing our existing Urban Renewal District in 2021 or 2022? What's the guess? David, David's still? David's here. Yep, I'm still, I'm still here. It's fiscal year 22-23, so um, the year, basically year 23. Okay. So I have, I have a potential suggestion. There is a property on 12th and Sher Sherwood, and I think it's, what is that, Gerda or Garcia? It's really small. Gerda, I think. Gerda. Gerda. And I think, it, I think it used to be or still is a place where one of the car rental companies keeps all their oh. cars. Bruce, you talked about swapping that out because that's prime land that could be developed, and that would be a big increment if it did develop because it's just basically dirt right now. That might be one you want to consider including. Yep. Absolutely. Thank you. You guys, you guys know where I'm talking about? Yep. That yep. Yeah. But I'm asking the consultant. We'll make sure that they do. <laughs> this is yeah, that I don't know. know. I found 12 point. here. But anyway, I'm sure Bruce and Julia, uh, Julia can show us. Yeah. Yes, I just even talked to a developer about it today. So we'll see. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's, At some point, there will be an interest. 
that most folks look at that land and they don't like the idea of building the road, the parallel road um, that's on the TSP from Gerda to Olds. Oh, I think this is great. My That's all I can think of. So um, will Nick and Elaine, um, will we'll re get them to revise the, the boundaries, or I guess Nick to revise the boundaries um, a little bit based on the conversation, and he and his team will analyze those and we'll come back in about a month. And then, Nick, what... Remind me what happens in a month when you come back with that data and then what the next step after that is. Yeah, so in a, the conversation in a month will be where we are identifying uh, all the big thorny issues that will come out. So we'll have our projections of revenue and we'll have our preliminary list of projects. And, you know, we'll show how big the funding gap is and how long we think it will take for certain projects to be funded. And... Um, that's where we'll really wind up having, I think, a, a conversation about can we make any of these urban renewal areas work? How successful will they be? Which ones have the most promise? Um, do we need to add more land or more assessed value to one of these to make it work? So those kinds of conversations that we can have in a month, uh, and then based on that, we'll, we'll take your input into consideration, make any final tweaks and changes to our analysis, and write it all up in a final report that we'll bring back later. Awesome. So I, I do have a question on the on the side of our current urban rural just or boundary area. Um, what's the what's the process for determining how much um, how far we can reduce that still meet our financial obligations? Um, you know to to create room to in the other areas. So. Over the next month, I'll be working with um, David to talk through that. I know he's done some initial look at some of your bond covenants to see what restrictions there might be on reduction of acreage. Typically, I've, I've done this with some other cities. We've been able to reduce acreage of the tax exempt parcels and right of way pretty easily. Um, if, uh, if we need to, and I, I think we probably will. We can reduce other acreage to get you down to the point of um, being able to make meet your obligations, but also then free up some acreage. So we'll we'll be working with your city staff to go through that and identify how much assessed value you need to be able to meet your obligations and what else we might be able to reduce to give you more capacity to do other areas. So we'll be working on that. Okay, yeah, we have lots of churches in that mix. We've got lots of schools in that in the existing boundary. Lots of schools, lots of churches. And those right. can all be eliminated. Right. High school football field. Yes. Yeah. Um, perfect. So that will be part of this study. That's awesome. Correct. Good. Awesome. Yeah, well, uh, appreciate you guys coming and, and working with us and and staying late, even if. Uh, the positive, you didn't have to drive. Drive. <laughs> That's right. You don't have to drive home. That's right. Yeah, very nice presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you all for your time. Yes, that was very helpful. I appreciate it. Good. Anything else on the to-do list, Joe? No, I appreciate everybody sticking with a very, very long work session. Um, our intent was not to do all of these all together. These were things that were previously planned and spread out, but I think we covered a lot of ground tonight. We got a lot of good input from council on the three work session topics. Um, apologize for not having the, the materials for the audit stuff. Uh, if you have questions, please uh, reach out to David and I. We'll be happy to answer them if you want to bring back TKW, we can do that as well. Um, but uh, I just appreciate everyone's long attention span. This is a little longer than normal. So, and, and, the, I, and the tie survived, Joe. The, the tie survived the night. Yes. <laughs> so, nice to get back to some normal business too. Yes, very much, definitely. So, hey, did my sound improve over the meeting? Yes. 
Yeah, you not. Yeah, whatever you did, it would be perfect. Thank you for that. Which kid helped you with that, Kim? Brad. <laughs> Brad did. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> He's a big kid. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions on anything before we end for the evening? I'm good. Nope. Thanks, everybody. Have a great, great rest of your evening. Night. Have a good night. Good night. night. Thank you, guys. I know. Julia, are you still there? Oh, she left.